please read the title of the resolution? Resolution 170043, resolution authorizing councils, committees on legislative oversight and public health and human services to hold hearings examining the incidents of raccoon infestations in the city of Philadelphia and administrative solutions for the public health concerns posed thereby. I want to start off by reading an opening statement and I want to thank my colleague, Alsman, my colleague, Councilman Al Tockenberger, for being here today as well. So the purpose of bringing together um, this particular hearing is based upon um, my work as a councilman over the past um, six years and addressing the issue of um, the quality of life of our neighborhoods, but most significantly over last summer and this last, last summer and the beginning of this summer, we've been having significant amount of calls from constituents regarding the issue of um, the infestation of raccoons um, throughout um, Grays Ferry, Point Breeze, Southwest Philadelphia, and parts of um, the Graduate Hospital area neighborhoods. Um, this issue is particularly important because raccoons are not just, um, in some cases, they can be looked at as a nuisance, but most importantly, a public health risk. They not only terrorize residents and cause sanitation problems, but also cause injury and transmit diseases, including rabies. I know firsthand from the work that I've done um, and doing tours throughout my councilmatic district and listening to uh, my constituents um, that this is an issue of um, vital concern. You know, over the past week, and I had some folks um, who thought that um, me hosting um, this hearing um, my time could be better used, my time could be better utilized um, focusing on um, other issues of, from their perspective of importance, but I recognize that being a, a individual who live in a neighborhood, particularly a Point Breeze, um, understand that making sure we improve the quality of life of our neighborhoods is just as important as, as any other public policy issue that we address here in the city of Philadelphia, and most importantly as taxpayers, um, they have, my constituents have a right to get questions from our city to see what are we doing to address this particular issue. And so um, I want to thank everyone for being here today. I want to also thank my colleague, Councilman Helen Gim, um, for joining me here today as well. I'm going to start off by reading um, two statements from um, some constituents that were submitted um, to my office. And it was also just this morning, while I was walking my dog, um, down the street, um, a constituent pulled over, um, got out of her car, um, thanked me for hosting the hearing, but most importantly talked about how um, she cannot come outside in her backyard and um, enjoy herself. Um, her daughter cannot come outside in her backyard and her, and her daughter enjoy um, herself, as well as how the raccoons have pr pretty much been terrorizing her backyard, tearing up her plants. And her, her last comment was, if these raccoons get inside my house, I'm moving. And so this is an issue that I do not minimize. Um, this is an issue that I think that should deserve the same type of response from the city as all the other major issues that we address. And so I want to start off by reading um, a letter from a constituent who lives in the Point Breeze section of South Philadelphia. To whom it may concern, I live in the Point Breeze section of Philadelphia who are having a very large problem with rats, raccoons, and possums. I would like for you to help remove them from the area, hopefully with no harm to them. A lot of people in and around Point Breeze are having this problem. If you can please help us, we have small children and elderly people who can't outrun them. It would be very sad if someone is bitten. That's from a constituent who lives in Point Breeze. And the letter is dated May the 10th, 2017. This is from another constituent from Southwest Philadelphia. I'm not going to use that name. Um, for the, her name is Marsha Wall, and I have, my name is Marsha Wall, and I have been an active member of community of my community in Southwest Philadelphia for many years. Most recently, as the director of Empowerment Community, community Development Corporation, I'd like to begin by thanking you for the opportunity to submit written testimony about the ongoing issues that my neighbors and I are experiencing with raccoons here in Lower King Sessing and across Southwest Philadelphia. As a longtime resident 
of the 6,000 block of Trinity Street, I have watched the ongoing revitalization of the wildlife surrounding Cobbs Creek with great excitement. However, my neighborhood's proximity to the creek means that raccoons and other animals are frequently visited, are frequent visitors on my block. Recently, an abandoned house located at 6038 Trinity has become a nesting area for raccoons, and this has greatly increased the potential that my neighbors or I might have at might have a dangerous confrontation with one of these animals. My neighbors and I are not in a position legally or financially to maintain the neighbor's abandoned private property, and the current city policy seems to leave this ongoing issue unaddressed. I've been told that, that the Department of License and Inspections is not authorized to seal the second store openings or vacant structures, meaning that these animals can freely access the house. Furthermore, animal control's jurisdiction is limited in, in its scope to animals that are located in an occupied structure or appear to be sick or wounded. While I understand that free-ranging animals are a part of life in my neighborhood, I believe that the city can do more to minimize the potential for dangerous confrontations between the city's residents and, and our four-legged neighbors. A strategy that addresses the issue of vacant structures will help to ensure that raccoons are not finding shelter in or near residential areas where confrontations are more likely to occur. Thank you again for this opportunity to submit, submit testimony. So with that being said, I'm going to ask the clerk to please call the first witness, please. Charles Reeves, Kimberly Hickinson, and Mario Diadamo. Oh, we got a cop. Officer. Ladies first, officer, please state your name for the record and you can begin your testimony. Um, my name is Officer Kimberly Hickinson. Um, I'm going to say good morning, uh, Chairman Johnson, Chairman, Chairwoman Bass, and other committee members. Thank you for allowing me to testify to this issue. Um, I'm, I did a pre-written statement, so I'm just going to kind of read off of that. I'm going to say the cost of the raccoon problem, I think, is on the expensive side for many residents of Philadelphia. Um, I experienced the cost about a week ago when I heard a noise in my attic. I do not live in um, Southwest or I, I live actually in Germantown. So it's a citywide issue. It's not just the focus areas that were just talked about. Um, but I had a, a raccoon in my attic, and I called PACA. They advised me to call some wildlife service agency. I called on a Monday, and they told me that they would not be able to address my um, issue until Thursday. So that left me to wonder what was I going to do with a raccoon in my closet from Monday to Thursday. So hopefully, I was hoping that it left. But, um, which it did, but they actually came on Wednesday. They came a day early, which was good. I had someone um, home to let them in. The cost that they discussed over the phone was a $200 option. I'm not sure what I was getting for the $200, but then they discussed a $400 option. $400 for me probably would not have been such an issue but I work in South Philadelphia, and I know for a lot of the residents, they are on fixed incomes. That might be a stretch. So for $400, the gentleman came to my home. He went on my roof. He put a trap on my chimney. Um, that was if they were to exit, we were able to catch them. And then he foamed an area that he, he thought was another access point. It wasn't an independent assessment about what was going on. The person at my home had to point out the areas that they thought was a problem, and then they investigated it. It wasn't like I felt like they had 
superb knowledge about raccoons and how they would get into your home so they can check independently and say, okay, this is your problem, that's your problem. So if we didn't point it out, they didn't discuss it. He spray foamed one hole. If I were to buy a can of, it was this kind of stuff that you could buy from Home Depot or Walmart. That's seven to $10. A trap, I bought that from Walmart as well. That's about $50 to $75. With that being said, $400 for this person to do something that I probably could have took care of myself for less than $100 is, is kind of a stretch for a lot of people in Philadelphia. And then it's another charge for them to get it once they trap it. So that's another $50 every time a raccoon is caught for them to remove it from my property. Um, and then on top of that, they just relocate them. I don't know how far they relocate them because I live near a big park. I don't know if they're just going to let them go in the park so they can come back. But I think the pricing is definitely an issue. And even independent contractors, they see it as a big money mine to, to trap and get rid of raccoons. Um, we also have phone calls with the raccoons being in people's windows, in their trees. Elderly people are very scared of them. Kids are scared of them. Um, I just was on my way here talking to another colleague. Her, her grandmother, I think, lives on the 5800 block of Hatfield, and she was saying the same thing, that she lives near a park, and they migrate towards her block. And when it becomes dark, it's hard for pedestrians to walk down the street because you have these animals that kind of have taken over the block when it becomes dark. So I think it's a big problem, and I think it needs to be addressed in a more cost-effective manner just because it's so many people that may not be able to afford getting rid of these animals. That's it. Thank you. So can you please state your name for the record and you can begin, please? The name is Mario Diadamo, and I'd like to thank the council people, uh, Gim, uh, Johnson, and Taubenberg for allowing us to testify today. Uh, the officer has really given a good oversight of the problem. I've uh, lived uh, my current address in Packer Park area of South Philadelphia since 1999. Uh, more recently, I guess in the past four or five years, the problem with raccoons, possums, and groundhogs uh, is just uh, growing exponentially. You cannot go out at night without fear of coming into a raccoon, uh, possum, groundhog. I can give you some anecdotal stories. Uh, most recently, I called ACCT when there was a possum that was on my step bleeding. Uh, my dog went out and came back with blood on his face. Uh, I have a little terrier, uh, blood on his face, and I said, "What?" where this blood come from, and I go outside and there's a possum that had probably gotten into an altercation with either a raccoon or the groundhog. So there's blood coming out of it. Called the ACCT and they did respond because it was an injured animal. By the time ACCT came, the possum had left. Uh, the, the issue is I have what the officer is referring to is called a have a heart trap, right? Mm -hmm. I bought mine at Harbor Freight. They're like $40 there. Uh, so the conundrum is this, you can easily catch the animal. You put a uh, cantaloupe or something else into the trap uh, and the animal will get into the trap. Now, if you go to the Pennsylvania State Commission's website, and I tell you it says there, is that a landowner has the right to protect, landowners have the right to protect their property. Landowners may take action when personal property other than an agriculture cop is being destroyed, or when a sick or diseased animal poses a threat to humans, farm animals, or, or pets. Once the property owner or person in charge of property may take steps to capture or kill the wildlife. So the state's saying that if your property is being damaged, which happened to the officers, in my case, I have a number of things, but one is this raccoon that I caught and I have a hard trap uh, several times. Uh, you call up ACCT, they will not pick up the animal that is it caught in a have a heart trap. So I've, and you, you can see from the photo, they're not warm, fuzzy looking animals. They carry rabies, they're in the rabies vector. 
When the person from ACCT came to my house to address the possum question, he told my son, he looked at the trap, he said, I hope your father's not trapping groundhogs, they have rabies. So I am, you know, my shed is collapsed. They destroyed the foundations of homes. So we're stuck in this conundrum. If I lived in, outside of the county, I guess, in Luzerne or some other county, if you catch the animal in a trap, you can euthanize it. I don't want to euthanize it. I'm a hunter for 40 years, but I don't want to euthanize a groundhog in my yard. If ACCT has a contract with the city of Philadelphia and they have people on patrol going around looking for sick animals or stray dogs and stray cats, I think if you catch an animal and I have a hard trap, they should come and pick that animal up. Now, I made mention to some people in city council, perhaps we could even give a donation to ACCT. But what happened was when I've caught the groundhog at least three times, I call one of the companies listed on ACCT's website. I don't know if that's who you called. But they charge like $150 to come down and pick up the animal. When I, they will allow you to bring the animal up to ACCT if you catch it and I have a hard trap. I've tried that on two occasions. One occasion when I caught it in the trap, I brought it to the trunk of my car in the cul-de-sac where I live, and by the time I got to the trunk, the animal had taken off. It went through the trap, running into the street. Second time, I was able to get the trap into the trunk, took it up to ACCT, I believe 111 Hunting Park Avenue, went inside, talked to the people. They came out. When I opened up the trunk, the, the groundhog ran out and ran in their parking lot. The raccoons are another problem. They, when you go out to put out the trash, especially elderly people, you'll see them inside your, your trash can. My next door neighbor, unfortunately, just passed away last week. She, wanted to, she was willing to testify, but they're, they're afraid to put their trash out. Uh, there's dead raccoons. Packer Avenue, I saw a dead raccoon last week. Week before, there was another dead raccoon. So my thought is, if the state law says that you can trap and euthanize the animal, there, there's a reason why the state game law says that. It's because they can do tremendous damage to your property. My foundation of my home's in jeopardy. My shed has collapsed. The officer has had one in her house. If we're going to pay these private contractors, it would cost me probably $150 to $200 a month times 12 months a year. It costs me like $3,000. If ACCT has a contract, they'll pick up a sick or diseased animal. Can they be contracted for an extra service of picking up an animal that's perhaps trapped in a have a heart trap? They know how to handle those animals. If you can see from the photo, they have really big claws uh, and they have big teeth. And when they get out, they're dangerous. And they also they carry fleas and other diseases. Uh, these are not, you know, cute animals that the guy picks up on February 2nd. They're tamed. These are wild animals. And the raccoons, there's cases in Camden, New Jersey, less than six months ago, where a child was attacked. Uh, when they become rabid, now we're seeing them walking around in the daytime. I'm not an animal expert, but I know that when nocturnal animals walk around in the daytime, they can be rabid. So before we have an unfortunate circumstance, I think city council could either look at ACCT or give us some other insight, perhaps. Philadelphia police can euthanize the animal. I know that the deer in the past year, I, I'm on the board of Packer Park Civic Association. There's been at least 10 deer that have been killed by car on Patterson Avenue between 20th and Broad. One night last summer, my son went to look at the one deer that got killed just to look at it, and as he was looking at the one deer that got killed, a deer ran out and another car hit that deer. And Could we stay focused on raccoons, if you don't mind, please? Yeah, so well, we it's raccoon and groundhogs. I want to stay focused on raccoons and your experience with raccoons, please. My experience with raccoons are similar to uh, groundhogs. They, they ruin your property. They're danger to uh, your health and human safety because they can attack a person. They have people who are afraid to put their trash out. Uh, and I'm afraid that if a child's riding on a bicycle, uh, one of them's outside in the daytime, they're going to be running away from the raccoon. They're walking along the top of your fences. They're taking your trash out. They're going into our homes. 
uh, and they're doing a lot of damage. Thank you, sir. Can you please state your name for the record, please? Good morning. My name is Charles Reeves. I want to thank you again, Councilman, both of y'all, for bringing this situation. My, my thing is twofold. Uh, I, both of them already stated the, the facts. The thing is, we got kids now. I live in Grace Ferry Task Community. My blocks are smaller. We can't afford it. I got renters in my community. They can't afford for $400 to do that. So now what we do, we don't even have information on how to address the trash. So first of all, I would ask for information. Then second of all, I got two schools. I got Universal Work Me, University of Alcorn, and I have a park. So the raccoons, in the last three years, they have grown four times. Like I started out with six, we got 25. They walking around now. Our kids in the summertime, you know, like to stay out late. My whole concern is my babies, right? I don't want them to get bit. But our kids, you know, our little kids are, are curious, aggressive. They're not real scary. Right, you know what I mean? It's going to be a problem. My I live by alley, so my roof is already tore up. The, the raccoon that came off the tree, jumped on the, uh, our porches, and tore the hole in it. So that's something that I got paid for. You know, but everybody in my community can't afford this. I appreciate y'all coming with this fact, but I, I need information. We need to know how to kill them if we have to, right? Or trap them. We can't afford traps. So I'm letting you know. I'm not speaking for my old community, I can't, but I'm telling you, we can't afford traps. We can barely afford to pay our rent. So traps is not an you know, issue. You know, I mean, you, somebody's gonna help us, or it's gonna be a problem. I got young men, I hate to say this, I got young men running around with guns. Just the reality, right? My young boy's out of pocket. I don't want them shooting at a raccoon to hit my babies. This is a problem. I'm glad you brought it up, Councilman, and I don't got much to say more but you got to do something before it get out. It's summertime. There's, there's watermelons, there's cookouts. It's a problem, right? And, and again, my community deal with stuff kind of different. You know, they're a different breed. We got to talk to them a different way. If you grant me the information, I can reach out to you. So that's basically all I'm going to say. I know everybody else got time to say. But I, I, I like the, the fact that everybody wants to save them. That's all well. But we can't afford it. All right, thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Reeves. Questions for my colleagues? Councilman Al Tottenberger? I, I think what all of you have kind of brought apart, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, and this is for anyone that wants to answer it, um, is, is, is as follows, that it's very, very expensive to go to a private contractor. And then the question is, if you did it yourself, if you either borrowed the trap or maybe even the city uh, through a program could give you a trap or lend you a trap, the question is, what do you do with, with the animal? And that has to be a policy that uh, I think should be worked out with uh, you know, animal control. I mean, it just has to be because you, everyone that just spoke is absolutely correct in as far as they're dangerous. They, they, they have rat rabies, they could have rabies, uh, they certainly make a mess of, if you go into the trash, they, 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 they certainly can make a mess. I mean, a complete mess. Uh, and if they get into your home, God forbid, your home, uh, you know, burglars uh, don't sometimes do as much trouble as, as a raccoon will do, as they rip your house apart and cut wires and everything else. I mean, they just gnaw through things. And uh, so a policy has to come from it. But if, if you had an animal and, and you don't know what to do with it, that is a big problem because you've actually done half the work. That's the problem. An officer, thank you for your service as well. Yes. Thank you. I'm going to say I've contracted, um, I mean, I've contacted a private contractor before. Um, I forget who it was, but he described a price of $1,200 to do the same thing that they did for kind of like $400, but I think they probably had a more aggressive approach to it. But I'm going to say it's not only just the $400 that I had to pay, but it's also $50. Or depending on who you get, it's from anywhere from $50 to $200 to remove it. So it's not only costing you to protect your home, it's costing you to get rid of this animal as well. Right. So I think that that's the biggest thing is, as far as cost. Even if you gave out 
Um, if, if a policy was put in place as far as giving out traps to people that need them, it's the collection of these animals and where are you putting them? Because if you're taking them to, to parks that are still in neighborhoods, they're just gonna invade somebody else's home and do it, destroy somebody else's property. I have all the screens on my top floor are shredded because they are always trying to find a way in your home. So it, it definitely has to be a policy in place of how to also get rid of them. And that's important, particularly, officer, when you're doing the work, when you're capturing the animal, and also for the animal's welfare. Um, you know, maybe we can talk to some animal experts. Maybe there is a preserve somewhere in some place that uh, would uh, accept these animals, uh, if that's possible. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in hearing what some of the experts have to say. I, I thank you all for taking the time. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Can you, uh, before, uh, well, Al, anything you take out this meeting, we need information. We need to learn how to deal with them, how to pack, how to put the trash away, mm -hmm. how to close up our windows. You know what I mean? How to mm -hmm. tell our kids. That's the most thing that should come out of this. Because I know everything ain't going to get done fast. But if you could just put information online, wherever, however the city can give it out, then we can kind of fight it ourselves. Yeah. You know what I mean? We, we, we know how to work together. Sure. We to, we, but if we just had the, we don't have the information because I heard you can't shoot them. Like I heard you can't kill them. I, I don't know what you can do or what you can't do, but I know they're crawling in my porch. They don't, right here, I got a picture of them in my window. Mm. They looking at my wife and screaming because the raccoon looking upstairs in the window. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah. It's not yeah. funny, but we have to yeah, learn how true. to address it. And there's a lot of interesting or, or diverse information. The, the Pennsylvania Game Commission, I believe, states somewhere that you cannot release them, that you must kill them. Well, you cannot kill them in Philadelphia either, and it may not be the right thing to do, but on the other hand, they can't be in your house. I love animals, I really do. But they can't be living in your bedroom, and they can't be living with you, and it's just not healthy, it's not good, and we need to do something as a modern city to deal with this. And that's why we're having the hearing. I'm, I really and, want to also thank the leadership of uh, Council. And if I may add just Councilman, uh, one, Johnson. one last thing, is it's very easy to catch the animal. If you have a, have a heart trap, which they do not injure the animal at all, the animal walks in, they're safe, you catch them right away. So your primary point, Mario, and I know I talked about earlier, staying focused on the raccoons, but I know you, part of your testimony is about the groundhogs and so forth. But your primary, something like your primary essence, your argument is, what is the city actually doing, animal control unit, when you catch the animal, the exactly. response? Exactly. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, I just wanted to be clear on um, that key point that you were making. Councilman Helen again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I just wanted to acknowledge Mr. Reeve, and uh, you know, I think you raised the, a very important aspect, which is the commitment to a public information campaign about how to help communities address this issue. It's a health risk. It's obviously um, a serious concern for a lot of families. But I don't. I think we should be talking to animal control and, and our health department about how to do a better public information campaign out there that can help folks like yourself. And I do appreciate the amount of agency that you bring to this, you know, the idea that, look, give us the information and we'll try to figure this out. Um, the one thing that I think is also really important to, because in, in your particular case, you're seeing an uptick in your neighborhood. Um, animals are, and especially raccoons, are foragers, they're scavengers. They're going to go to places where there's trash and empty buildings. And uh, it's pointing to a broader issue around uh, neighborhood, uh, you know, neighborhood types of quality of life issues that I think that these animals are likely more a symptom of than necessarily a cause. So the, um, I'm, I'm curious about whether you feel like they, these known factors, attractors to raccoons and other uh, nuisance pet animals are, um, are increasing because you're seeing additional problems that we should be paying attention to in your, in your neighborhood. I think the abandoned buildings is up to, like 25% of my community is abandoned. So. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's a problem. But they tear down stuff. You know, I mean, they, they stuff, I guess, when it was hit back before, when they tear it down, they're coming out. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's the whole, the whole re, uh, what's the word? You know, I mean, the, the whole rebuilding of the community. Right. That, that's causing a problem, too. So, because wherever they was hiding or, or control, now they're coming out. And then it's a problem. So I agree with you 100% that it's other factors. 
and and as far as taking care of your trash. See, there's a whole bunch of factors, but the increase came with the abandoned buildings. I would say that's how I would feel. Yeah, and I think that that's been a known factor with a lot of these infestations is that they are attracted to trash, they are attracted to uh, vacant buildings and, and other types of things. So it, the more that we can kind of zero in and maybe take out some of these uh, very specific problems, but we're trying to be committed to addressing, um, you know, the, the bigger issue we have in our city, which is abandoned lots and, you know, vacant buildings and people who aren't taking care of or have left behind property that we should really be pe paying attention to. But thank you very much. All right, thank you, ma'am. My question was, um, what if it's not that issue? Because just where I live at, it's a lot of, I'm going to say forage, and th that's not going to be taken care of because there are parks. So it's nothing, it's not a trash issue. I mean, the only time I think it's a trash issue is probably on trash night. And uh, we encourage our neighbors to put their in a receptacle that has a lid that, that closes so they wouldn't be able to get into your trash. But I have a, on one side of the street, it's a big lot because it's a recreation center. Then on the top part of my, my block is a park because it's near to LaSalle. Then on... And then my backyard is pretty spacious, so it just attracts a lot of those animals that like to scavenge, as you said. So how do you combat that if it's not um, another environmental factor that's, uh, I guess, breeding them? Can I add, um, I agree with the officer because in my neighborhood, the trash can lids, everyone has secure lids. I have a double lock lid. The raccoons will pull, the, they're very smart animals. They'll pull the lids off or they'll scratch through the container. So there's nothing, it, it, it helps to keep the neighborhood tidy. It, it helps a lot, but this, there's no natural predators for these raccoons and, and other animals. There's no natural predators. So they have to be taken and either euthanized or relocated far away from the city. I do have a question I want to ask. So, so, and we do have animal control that's, who the experts, so they'll come in and give their presentation. But I do know, at least that it was plain to me that, uh, you know, when you talk about the public information campaign and how you maintain your trash and so forth can play a part. So I guess my question would be, um, prior to today, um, has this always been a problem? If the neighbor's always been tidy, Right, there's always been trash put in trash cans with lids. Has it been the same type of problem as it is now? Has it been in the past? In my neighborhood, I could speak you know, for my neighborhood solely, but the people have always kept their trash cans t uh, closed tightly, as in, she said in the officers. We live near a park, FDR Park, and uh, they're going to be coming from that park. There's been a whole area, Siena Place, where they've knocked down a lot of old abandoned homes, raccoons are coming out of that area in possum. Okay. I don't think there's any uh, thing that you can do to keep your house raccoon or possum or groundhog proof. I think they have to be caught, released, or caught and euthanized. And it has to be done professionally because it, it's a danger when you're touching those danger. traps. Okay. That's it. Any other questions from the panel? So if you want to stick around while ACT Animal Control give their um, testimony, then you'll have some information as to their approach and so forth. And if y'all want to um, go also provide additional questions as they go through the process, that may be helpful as well. Can the clerk please call the next panel? Thank you. Vincent Medley. And will other departments from the administration please come forward to answer questions as well? regarding the dogs? Yes, uh, Councilman, I was. You pretty busy this month. <laughs> so. 
think we also have representative from License and Inspections, the Health Department. And Streets Department. Okay. Benson, you ready? Yes, yes, Thank I you. am. Please Counselor. state your name and title for the record, and then uh, uh, yes, your testimony. Yes, Chairman. Um, my name is Vincent Medley. I am the Executive Director of the Animal Care and Control Team of Philadelphia, who has the animal control contract with the City of Philadelphia. Uh, good morning, Chairman Johnson and members of the committee. My name is Vincent Medley, and I'm the Executive Director of the Animal Care and Control Team of Philadelphia, also known as Act Philly, and I am here to testify um, on addressing the nuisance behavior by raccoons. The issues of nuisance, um, the issue of raccoons as a nuisance is not only a Philadelphia phenomenon, but it is also a national one. Raccoons living in an urban environment is nothing new. In fact, it can be argued that raccoons have always lived among us. In the immortal words of the street poet LL Cool J, don't call it a comeback, they've been here for years. <laughs> that being said, I recognize that having rac raccoons living among us and often dwelling within the homes of our citizens is a serious concern to the council and the people whom they live among. Unfortunately, raccoons don't have the same aversion that many humans do about being neighbors. The Humane Society of the United States website states, raccoons don't know that our luscious gar vegetable gardens, uncapped chimneys, and full bird feeders aren't there just for them. It even goes beyond that. Raccoons live among us because they have ample shelter and food resources to live and thrive in the community. It is also true that the total eradication of raccoons is not practical, legal, humane, or possible. It is for these reasons that the national best practice and one that Act Philly strongly endorses is peaceful coexistence. While on its face, peaceful coexistence sounds like a passive approach, the reality is that peaceful coexistence employs methods that minimize human interactions with raccoons, keep them out of their living areas, and strive to keep the community safe. You may be aware that the Pennsylvania local governments, that Pennsylvania local governments are preempted by the state from engaging in the regulation of wildlife. How, however, Act Philly, as an exempted nuisance wildlife control operator, has authority over wildlife that actually creates a nuisance, a nuisance which means causes damage to property or is a risk to human health or safety. The ability of Act Philly to, re to, Philly to regulate raccoons is quite limited, and as such, education of the public is key. In 2016, Act Philly embarked on a public information campaign that included media stories, presentations to neighborhood groups, and partnered with Chairman, Chairwoman Bass and the Managing Director's Office to create palm cards that detail in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese the services that Act Philly provides and tips on how to peacefully coexist with raccoons. For our part, Act Philly works cooperatively with city departments to respond to health and safety issues with respect to raccoons. LNI con contacts us to respond and assist in clean and seal operations. Public Health and Act Philly work together to address any rabies related issues caused by raccoons. I believe any danger posed by raccoons is being effectively addressed by the current Act Philly policy of only responding when the public is in imminent danger of injury, the raccoon is sick or injured, or in, to eliminate the spread of disease to people or animals. Per the Center for Disease Control, only one person ever has died of raccoon rabies. The greater issue is the nuisance that raccoons pose, particularly in homes and neighborhoods. There are root causes for raccoons living in neighborhoods. These causes include vacant and dilapidated buildings and discarding food in, an unprotect in unprotected ways that allow raccoons to access them. Because animals usually are cared for by humans, whether the humans realize it or not, we recommend that all Philadelphian residents practice the following best practices to deter raccoons. Do not feed raccoons. Use metal or heavy plastic trash containers. 
Keep the lid tightly fastened to keep odor from escaping. If needed, use bungee cords or ropes to put or put a weight on the lid to, so raccoons can't open it. Keep food away from raccoons. Raccoons tend to feed at night. If raccoons steal food from your neighbors, from your pet's outside food dish, feed your pet during the day and bring the bowl inside at night. Keep barbecue grills clean or stored in a secure place. If you see a raccoon in the yard, turn on the lights and make noise to scare it off. Do not corner a raccoon or force it to defend itself. Use a wildlife repellent to drive raccoons from your property. You can buy a repellent at Home Depot, I mean at home, at a home or garden uh, or discount hardware store. Clean up spilled seeds around your bird feeders or bring your bird feeders inside at night. Light your yard or alley with floodlights or motion detected lights. Um, don't give raccoons a place to stay. Seal any openings on your property, especially buildings that like sheds and garages. Report vacant unsealed properties to 311 so they can be sealed as quickly as possible. In conclusion, Act Philly recently met with several city departments, streets department, LNI, health, and zero waste and litter to discuss raccoon, inf raccoon infestations. We recommend a public campaign that informs residents on ways to keep raccoons off their property, stronger enforcement on property owners who have allowed human dwellings to become a refuge for raccoons and other wild animals, and presentations to the neighborhood associations led by Act Philly to assist the community in dealing with raccoon issues. Um, I thank you uh, for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. The other department heads, you're not here to give testimony, you're just here to answer questions, correct? Okay, thank you, Vincent. So before we get into ask, asking questions, I wanna get an overview from you, Vincent, on the current campaign that you started in 2016 because you also give recommendations to start another public campaign. So um, how effective has it been? What's the strategy of the campaign that you started in 2016 working with Council, Councilwoman Bass? And give us an idea of where what's taking place with that campaign to date. Um, so we have made palm cards available um, in the three languages I described earlier. Um, uh, we have uh, partnered with Parks and Rec to to get those that information out to the parks to uh, the community. We also um, have pre presented to neighborhood associations uh, regarding raccoons and the ways that um, we can assist them, de um, depending on the um, the nature and the, so the the reason for the raccoons in their neighborhood. Do you have a do you have data on the number of presentations that have been um, done over the last year since 2016, particularly um, on this topic of raccoon infestational interaction, and also a list of the actual community groups that you have engaged, engaged in um, about information sessions regarding raccoons? I can get the, the specific information. I know I myself uh, went to uh, the Hunting Park Neighborhood Association and presented on raccoons uh, personally. Um, and uh, we, we do it basically on a case-by-case -case basis. Once we uh, get information um, that a neighborhood has a generalized problem, we, we do um, invite them to ask us to come to speak to their neighborhood association. In fact, the, the gentleman that, one of the gentlemen that testified uh, at the, in the last panel, I've already reached out to him to, um, to start that process. But wouldn't, I'm just trying to get clarity, just trying to understand, because I know if we started a campaign in 2016, and then at the end of your testimony, you say you recommend that we start a campaign, I guess that means we want to restart the campaign that you embarked on in 2016. Why? is the campaign on a case-by-case -case basis. Like, a campaign for me is, you ever see the campaign about tobacco, cigarettes? It's like commercials, it's like stickers, it's like information PSAs on the radio, 
to address the issue. So I'm just trying to get some clarity on, is this a campaign, or is it when someone calls and they need help, we'll go out? Because that's not a campaign, that's just more somebody called, filed a complaint, and we were responsive as opposed to being proactive. So I'm just trying to get some clarity. So, so, so clear. our campaign is a lot smaller than a citywide campaign because we are a nonprofit uh, that is, uh, you know, making the most of the resources we have. Mm -hmm. So the, the recommendation is that the city as a whole okay, uh, provide the, uh, the the funding and the, mm -hmm. the that support and that spokesperson um, Makes sense. that um, that can you know really connect with the community. Okay. Now, I have another question. Um, in terms of we've been having complaints all throughout uh, the city of Philadelphia. Do you have data on? Which neighborhoods in the city of Philadelphia you receive the most complaints from regarding raccoons? We can get that information from you uh, for you. Uh, we we I don't have that data right now. I know mm -hmm. that uh, 311 collects data on raccoon calls as well. Um, because our scope is so limited, mm -hmm. we only um, we only record calls that we actually have an officer respond to. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Councilwoman Gill. Um, thank you very much. And I'm wondering if we could have a representative, or well, actually, before I ask that, the um, so the public information campaign is your palm cards and a club, uh, and some of the meetings going out into the neighborhoods and um, and I think uh, you know, it, and then some media stories. Is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, Councilman. So beyond that, do you feel like uh, you need more assistance in order to get a much more robust campaign going? Uh, yes, I believe. Um, and I think it, the, the idea is to better coordinate, um, especially with the council offices mm -hmm. um, and the uh, neighborhood associations. And I think that uh, just building a structure to communicate um, and to be able to provide that information, I, I think, is, is what I would recommend. Mm -hmm. um, and is it possible to get a health department representative just to figure out uh, where we are on on um, on the public information aspect of it? Is someone from the health department here? Yeah. Hi. I just want to take a I want to take a moment and acknowledge. The presence of Councilman Cindy Bass, we had to step out for a moment, as well as Councilman Green. Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. My name is Dr. Palak Ravel Nelson. I'm the Director of Environmental Health Services for the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. So I'm trying to, uh, I, I think you heard the testimony before, and also some, um, you know, it sounds like there's a lot of questions from our, our public about how we handle. Uh, infestation, what are people supposed to do, and of course people know to call animal control, but beyond that I'm not entirely clear that there's external information that's readily available to communities and individuals if they're faced with this situation, and could you talk a little bit about how the health department's working with ACCT and what you think we can do to better inform our communities about this? Sure, so absolutely. Um, the good news is that ACCT and um, the Vector Control Program within the uh, Division of Environmental Health Services are located in the same building, as well as our Division of Disease Control. So if there was a scenario or a situation where there was a, a case of a rabbit raccoon or, or you know, the potential of rabies, um, the three groups would work together. ACT would be responsible for the animal as that's their expertise, and we would work with the exposed person to provide the education. As far as proactive education is concerned, we really, um, with uh, Vince and, and their group, they take the expertise on the animal behavior issues, and we will work with them to help them, if, if needed, to go out to do educations and provide information. We also try to link on our web page information about education and how to address issues with um, exclusion and what to do if you know, a raccoon gets in your home and how to handle that. The, the best kind of um, information that we could provide would be very almost exactly the same as what um, 
Mr. Medley explained, which is, you know, cover your trash, keep food inside, um, and then try to seal up openings and provide exclusion. What's the last major public information campaign the health department did, would you say? I know um, you do a number of them, but would um, you? On raccoons? No, or? just in general. Like, oh, just in general? Mm -hmm. um, well, I could talk to you for days I about know. those. I uh, pick one? We've, we've done um, our extensive campaign on lead. Yeah. As a council so could you talk a little bit, like if you do a major public information campaign, say on lead, what would be like the rollout? What is the city's approach towards it? How extensive is it? And how much resources do you actually put towards that? Sure, so I'm trying to get a relative compare about what we could assist with on the, on the, uh, you know, on the other end of it for a new Campaign. No problem. I can absolutely, and all of a sudden I'm getting warm, so I'm gonna. I was freezing in here. I'm gonna go ahead and take my jacket off. Um, so our lead campaign, where uh, last uh, summer we conducted an entire campaign to educate landlords about and families to make sure that they actually get their child lead tested and that if they're living in a tenant property that they go ahead and ask the landlord for a lead safe or lead free certificate. The process involved um, having a, a person that is specialized, trained in developing literature for the ad campaign and then we went ahead and um, bid out the um, different companies. It was, I believe, about $30,000, Councilwoman, but I can get the exact number if needed. And once the pictures and the appropriateness and the literacy level and the language issues were all sorted out, then the campaign was rolled out on SEPTA buses, on, mm -hmm. at stops. Um, so it was essentially a blitz for about, I would say, two months. And from that, um, we did find that based on tracking information, at least 40,000 people visited that, but please don't quote me on the data. We can get you those mm -hmm. details. We have them available. And essentially, it was a full-on education campaign, so that would mm -hmm. be something that could be done, but uh, um, I think the biggest part of it is ensuring that the appropriate message with, you know, acts expertise along with um, our folks is the, the appropriate message is designed with the information and then rolled out accordingly. Yeah, I, I think that that sounds right. And uh, it sounds like the, the ACCT already has these palm cards and so it's probably worth a review about how appropriate that is, whether it's convertible into a uh, more public space. But I think what some of the community groups are requiring is just a more energized kind of public focus on what to do should you face this kind of situation. Um, and then just uh, one other quick question for, uh, thank you very much. Sure. And then uh, one other quick question for uh, Mr. Medley um, is, so uh, could you talk a little bit about what you feel like is the scope of the problem? Um, I know you deploy, you only record if you deploy what percentage or can we get any uh, like understanding of how many calls you get in versus how many actually individuals get deployed out? Um, and are we seeing an uptick in terms of the number of complaints both either received or being sent out to? So in looking at the, um, the, our data, um, this past year we um, impounded, um, took into our care uh, custody, 441 raccoons, which is up from 2015 uh, when we uh, took in about 314. Um, so in the last, Five years, the second, um, the highest year we've had was 2012 when we impounded uh, 459. Um, according to 311, uh, the total number of calls uh, regarding raccoons as a whole was 2,826. Uh, Could you repeat the number again? Uh, 2,826 uh, raccoon calls. Uh, and that was general information um, like what to do if I have one in my house, um, what should I do if I get bit, um, who do I call about an injured wildlife, and then also who do I call about an animal stuck in a tree or inside of a car. All right, thank you. Benson, I just had one question. Um, what's the, the relationship between ACT and the city of Philadelphia? Explain that from a funding standpoint because it sounds like also you're limited in resources when it comes to dealing with not just the raccoon issue, but also I know 
when we have a lot of issues regarding um, dogs that bite individuals and the response time and going out, um, that becomes an issue as well. Just give me a brief overview. How much is the budget? How much funding does the city provide to help you do your job? So we, um, the city provides us about $4 million a year to, oh. um, to, uh, to provide That's a nice animal. budget. I, I didn't know you were going to say $4 million, but go ahead. Animal care and control. Um, well, and as some of the data in, um, would suggest is that it's, it's, it's below the, the national standard, uh, okay. the $4 million. What's the national standard? It's uh, $4 per capita, which would put us about at $6 million okay. for a city our size. Okay. Um, but our our relationship is that we we are the animal control, but we have we contract for services. So um, those services uh, um, are um, are specific to um, to public safety issues that are imminent, and then uh, dog and cat issues for the most part. Uh, the reason why I think uh, we, we have it that way is because one of the national best practices, especially when you talk about uh, lifting or increasing the life-saving rate, is to take resources um, that would be used for wild animals where the only, for the most part, the only exit for them is euthanasia um, and diverting that to animals that, um, so you end up euthanizing the raccoons, those resources that you could have been using to save animals, um, you end up, because you're, you're so, the resources are so limited, you end up euthanizing dogs and cats. And so it's a, it's a heavier burden on the, uh, on the shelter as a whole, which, which increases the euthanasia rate. Okay. Councilman Alan Tottenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Medley. Thank you for your service and the things you're doing, because I know you have, I don't think it's uh, easy work that you're doing. I think the campaign that you outlined is excellent, and anything we can do to help spread that word. Where I have a, a little difficulty, though, is which goes beyond the, uh, the scope of the uh, information you give out. If that raccoon is actually in your house, you know, that takes on a whole different realm. I mean, that, that, that could put a family in panic, and, and, and also the fact of the matter is that uh, uh, it's extremely unhealthy, even forget about the rabidness and biting. I mean, raccoons have fleas, they have all kinds of other problems, and uh, they're not meant to live with humans. If someone has a, 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 a raccoon actually in the house, and they know they're there, and they call your offices, what happens? If the raccoon is in a living area, uh, yes. then we go out. If it is inside like an attic or inside of a wall, then uh, it's, uh, that's outside of the scope of what we do. Okay, and then you, well then, okay, say it's in the, say they know it's in the house, but you know, it's not gonna come and greet you at the door, and thank you for coming, it's gonna probably hide in a little place and probably might be in the wall. Then, then what happens if they're in, if they're in the building but not visible? So, it, because it, the being inside of the building takes a specific set of skills uh, that we do not in our industry have. That's more of a pest control issue. So uh, we heard earlier about um, installing exclusionary devices, which um, they look like traps, but they allow the, the, the raccoon to leave the, uh, the uh, building, but not allow them to go back through that same space. So the installation of those takes a specific expertise. Um, the assessment of the extent of the problem um, is something outside of the scope of, you know, I. I started as an animal control officer in 1999, so I've been well, doing this for 18 you know years. The, the business very well. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, and so it's just outside of the scope of what we're trained to do. Uh, we, you know, our focus is um, is public safety, uh, but imminent public safety, especially being um, the um, using the resources to the maximum. Um, and so when it comes to raccoons or any wildlife inside of a building, uh, we only go out if a human um, has a threat of being in personal contact with that animal or the animal is sick or injured or shows some sign of uh, rabies. Well, I, I would differ just slightly with you on that in the sense if they're in the walls, they're, 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 they're gonna figure a way to come out. They're there hiding. I mean, I mean and, 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 and a raccoon or a groundhog or anything of that nature, they're big animals compared to 
mice and other things, which uh, is more like a, a, a wildlife control. But if, okay, it, it, they have that, they then capture it or you capture it, or then what happens? You take it with you? Uh, yes, if we, if we capture it, it does come to our, um, our location and we generally euthanize it and uh, okay. test it if we believe that there's a possibility of rabies. Well, just so we have a sense for you know, disease control, I, 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 I get that. The, um, in the numbers you gave, you, you, cap well, you say impounded, is that captured or brought in 314 and 441 raccoons? That uh, 441 raccoons in 2016, that includes uh, uh, brought in from the public and also brought uh, to the shelter by our animal control officers. So you can actually, if someone were to have one of the have a heart traps, which we've talked about before, they trap it, they can then bring it to you, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Do you ever, if that is, if that is also, do you do the reverse where they have the animal in a have a heart uh, trap, but uh, do you come and pick it up? It, it depends on, um, a lot of it has to do with us assessing the situation. Um, a, a lot of times that is possible if we've had a previous conversation with the citizen regarding the nature of the, the issue. But if the citizen brings the, the animal to you, you will unequivocally take it. Yes, we will take it. Okay, all right. If you had more resources, could you do more? You had more dollars in your budget to take care of? It, to tell you the truth, if, if we had more resources, I'd, I'd probably ask that we divert it to something else uh, because we still are not um, where, we, where I'd like to be in terms of all of our services, in terms of dogs and cats um, and and assist in the public with, because that's our greater, that is a no, much greater but still, public. A, a raccoon in a house can be a big problem to a family. I mean, one, you heard the pricing that the officer gave, what it costs to call a private uh, you know, animal control person. Mo mo many Philadelphians don't have that kind of money. Right. Between four or $500, even there was a price given a, a, in, in over $1,000. So I think this is where we need to, to work with you. Let me also ask you this. In, in comparison to your all overall operation, what is the percentage of wildlife that you deal with? I mean, how? So in terms of wildlife and um, small exotic animals, we, we, and we pick up about 1,400 out of the 22,000. What, what's your definition of a small exotic animal? So like anything from a hamster to oh. possum to um, snakes. Um, we get, we have had alligators into the, in the shelter. Alligators? Yes, sir. Chickens. Um, we get pretty much. I mean, any, it sounds humorous, but it's not. When you, right, I, right. I, I, I get you. So we, and part of this conversation is uh, for us as a shelter is about uh, the flow of animals, and we we are con consistently trying to figure out ways to slow the flow of animals into the shelter because there's only so many so much resource that we have. Correct. And so the best practice is to limit it as much as we can. And, and especially for um, life-saving, one of the recommendations is uh, to, to lessen the burden that wild animals have on the, on, on the shelter. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, has there been any dialogue between um, animal control and state government, government regarding exempting Philadelphia from, from the euthanasia, euthanasia requirement? Uh, yes, we've, we've had um, dialogue with uh, Dog Warden, with, uh, with the Game Commission as well. And what's the status? Um, in terms of uh, euthanasia? Yes. Um, when it comes to wild animals? Yes. We, our ability to, to we euthanize May, that's generally the, the option for wild animals. Um, one of the reasons why is because the resources that would get the animal out alive um, are just not there considering the volume. And so a wildlife rehabilitator, for instance, you know, in order to relocate a raccoon, you'd have to keep it a certain amount of time. Understood. Um, and that is to... And that's where the resources come into play at. Yes, yeah, yes Chairman. Okay. And, the, um, and that's because... Uh, Relocating wildlife is is a very good way to spread disease um, because you don't know what an animal's incubating and if it stays in its own population, you know that if a disease broke out, that it's con it's uh, it's isolated to that group rather than maybe possibly having an outbreak 
that occurred because wildlife is being relocated. So when you say staying inside its own population, and like right now we're talking about staying inside people's backyards and neighborhoods throughout the city of Philadelphia, which is technically not their own environment. They came there from somewhere else. Like, so what would your response be to the constituent that says, again, my neighbor, my backyard and my backyard, like I heard this morning, again, on my way to work, woman said there's a family, raccoons inside my backyard. And I don't think she thinks that that's their natural habitat. So how do you, how, how will you address that from a public health and a public safety standpoint? Because you know, over this past week, and a lot of people I talked to, a couple of people made some comments like, you could be working on something much more bigger and pressing. And I responded, and I know you mentioned one, only one incident ever took place of someone being bitten by a raccoon, right? But we're trying to be preventive and proactive, right, on the front end. Because usually, us as elected officials who sit up here at this table, when something goes wrong in this city, Everyone points the finger and say, how come you weren't doing this early? And we've been calling and we've been calling, we've been calling. So now we're trying to be proactive. So we don't get a phone call that a kid was in the wrong place. Well, actually, a kid was probably in the right place at the right time, right, right place at the wrong time, as a result of these raccoons being all throughout neighborhoods in the city of Philadelphia. So like, like at what point, with your limit, I know you have limited resources, and you said basically, quite frankly, and be honest with you, in so many words, you said if I had more money, this still wouldn't be a priority, because dogs and cats are what the priority is right now. And so, I mean, if this is animal control, you do get a four million dollar budget from the city of Philadelphia, actually, which council approves. At what point in time did this become some level of priority? To say, okay, you know what? Let's step it up a little bit. Let's come up with a strategic plan in terms of making sure that we're working in partnership with license inspections, the health department. I see you put on their Vision Zero, Department of Parks and Recreation. Do y'all meet monthly? Do y'all meet bi-monthly to say, okay, what are the issues that are taking place out there? I'm just trying to get an understanding because right now it seems like at the end of the day, even with our testimony, I mean, your leadership just says, listen, we'll, we don't have that many resources. And even though y'all give us $4 million, if you gave us another two, which would be $6 million, it'd be national standard, um, I probably still want to put more money in working on saving dogs and cats. So I'm just trying to get a little more clarity on, like, how do we move forward if technically kind of saying, you know, other things should be more of a priority than this public health issue, at least in my eyes. And so... Um, it, one and if I'm wrong, give me just clarify for yeah, me. Yeah. If I'm looking at it from a different perspective or I missed something, help me. So, Chairman, we... Um, we have no problem with making uh, the addressing raccoons a priority. Uh, the question is what the solution is. Mm -hmm. Right now, I do not believe we have enough uh, data to, okay. to say this is how we're going to resolve the problem. Okay. So in generalized issues like this, especially um, raccoons, uh, I know in Chicago they did a study on uh, coyotes. Um, it's some type of birth control is generally the the answer mm -hmm. um, because when when we take a raccoon out of the community we take one raccoon that raccoon's resources now have are open to another raccoon which mm -hmm. that raccoon um, what generally happens is that ra the next raccoon uses those resources to have a litter mm -hmm. so the litter survives off of those resources but the problem is is now where one raccoon was uh using those resources. Now four or five are using those resources. So they crowd each other out and they start to push. And that's why we see them in, in, in the city because, you know, we, they had ample space in the suburbs, in the country, but the building um, all over the, uh, this area um, has really pretty much trapped the wildlife. And so they're pushing back because they don't have any other place to go. And as, as you hear, not only are they inside of buildings, but they're also in, in a lot of the, uh, this is a very lush city in terms of um, green spaces and they're coming out of the green spaces okay. to get the food and the shelter that humans provide. Understood, okay. Councilman Green, I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Councilman O'Neill. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a very uh, interesting topic, um, personally, because actually a week ago I had to catch a raccoon, um, which was interesting. Um, um, about a week ago, um, and what was interesting is that um, this is not my first encounter with raccoons. I live in Mount Airy, which is a very leafy area. Okay. Um, but what was interesting is that normally when I've seen raccoons, it's normally in the evening or early in the morning. I get up at a very early time to go to the gym. And so when I was leaving my house this a Sunday afternoon, the raccoon was looking right at me. So, um, and so we called someone to come in to catch the raccoon. And I think the concern is that, um, and having a, a father who you know, grew up in the South, so I had some kind of understanding of wildlife. And the fact that this, wild co this raccoon was going through um, trash during the daytime made me think that this raccoon may have been diseased or had some other type of issues. Uh, and so that raised, that raised a concern with me. And so the challenge was that, you know, my house and my neighbor's house, we share a driveway. You know, I have, I have a small dog, I have a, a teenage son, my next door neighbor's children a little younger. They could have easily been playing outside when this raccoon was there. And so that raised, raised some concerns. Um, when you talked about, and I heard some of the data about the number of raccoons that you trap on an annual basis, do you do any type of analysis of where those, where those uh, raccoons, you're c catching them? Because I think having more proactive, as, as um, Councilman John was saying, if we know you have raccoons in this area of the city or that area of the city, what we can do, from, and I know resources are tight, what we can do from a more proactive way of getting information out to neighbors in those areas saying, listen, um, what are you doing in reference to your trash? How are you maintaining your trash? Other type of um, information in a more targeted way. Uh, so I, my first question is, do you do any type of analysis on where you're catching raccoons over a period of time? Uh, currently, we do not. We uh, only address it as a um, as something imminent, uh, an imminent public uh, issue. Um, but it's on a case by case basis. I mean, clearly, I mean, because ACCT has been around for some time. I think the data of number of raccoons you've caught over the years, you easily should be able to put together some analysis of where you've caught the raccoons, and that way you can do more intensive outreach to neighbors and constituents in those areas about the raccoon issues that they're having. We, yes, yeah, definitely, Councilman. We can, uh, we can, we have the ability to heat map, so we we could uh, put together a heat map of right. records. And I think that's something to be helpful for uh, members of council. That if you do some type of heat map or analysis of where raccoons are most prevalent, and especially around this time of year, it tends to have more raccoons in the spring and the fall uh, when people have you know, activities and those type of things, and trash is more prevalent. So I think that's information you need to get out to the district council members and actually all council members so they can better inform their constituents. Um, I know some years ago, Council President um, Clark had hearings regarding raccoons, and um, I'm curious in reference to this. I'm looking at your testimony on the first page, and I know there's some challenges because we, at the state level, we're preempting doing certain things because raccoons is considered wild, wildlife, and that's under the um, purview of the state government, and so we're preempting in some ways. But then, if a nuisance is something that comes damaged, that if the wildlife is a nuisance that causes property damage or risk to human health or safety, how do you make that dis distinction? Because I think when Councilman Tallenberg was saying, if you have a raccoon in your property, that is creating, causing property damage. So how do you make the distinction between um, access to, you said living space, versus in the property, which is causing property damage and also being a nuisance? So currently, uh, the in order for us to make that assessment, we would need um, a city agency like LNI to say this animal caused damage to this property. Uh, we're, our, our staff does not, um, we can't detect the cause of damage to, to property. Um, so for instance, if a property is already has holes in it, uh, not related to the raccoons, and the raccoons occupy that space, um, we'd have no way of knowing that. So um, I think in terms of our work um, and, and getting guidance from the, the council um, as to what specifically uh, you would like us to look into. I, I would work with the uh, managing director's office to craft something that fits um, within the scope of what we are able to do um, in, in addition to um, putting together a plan for individual circumstances. Um, you talked about, um, what, you talked a little bit about other cities, and I think you said uh, kind of a birth control perspective. Um, 
What do other cities do in reference to these issues? Especially, um, I'm thinking of uh, mid-Atlantic, northeast cities that have vacant properties, like mm -hmm. in Baltimore, uh, maybe like in New York City. Well, New York may be odd because of the resources they have, but I'm thinking like a Baltimore um, or a, a Richmond or Boston, you know, up and down the northeast uh, seaboard. What, what do they do from an animal control perspective? And are the legislative changes that we may need at the state level that give more ability locally to address um, certain type of wildlife like raccoons? I can look more into that, um, but and, and, and we have done some, some cursory looks at uh, cities like Baltimore. I know that they're, um, they're facing a very similar issue where it comes to where do you put the resources. And uh, the national best practice is peaceful coexistence um, and to only remove wildlife when it's absolutely necessary. Um, and so um, that generally is what the um, what the practice is. Um. But I guess my concern is that when you say the natural best practice is peaceful coexistence, but for uh, a neighbor that may not have the resources to call someone, luckily my next door neighbor you know, knew a guy that had been dealing with raccoons, so we were able to call him very quickly, came almost within you know, 12 hours to come and set up a trap. Uh, or someone that is not as, is, I'll say much more, um, aggressive and not as afraid of raccoons to will put up their own trap. But you know, you have many people in, in the city, especially um, seasoned citizens, my dad would say, who don't have the resources to um, bring someone from outside. Also, you know, because of you know, their own concerns about raccoons and whether that raccoon has rabies or other type of um, diseases, you know, peaceful coexistence is not really a great response. So I guess my question is, and per search, my response back to you is that that's not a really good solution when people are dealing with you know, raccoons on a regular basis. I know, yes, we're building and we're, and we're doing more and more um, building into their natural habitat, both in the suburbs and the city, but just saying peacefully coexist with a raccoon is not something that people want to do. So um, the, an animal control agency is not equipped to deal with the problem on the level that you are asking. Um, and the, what, I'm tell, what, what I mean by that is that in order to keep a, a raccoon out of someone's house, you've, you must install an exclusionary device. That lets the raccoons go out, but they can't come back in. Um, I'm not aware of any animal control agency in the United States. Um, and in fact, I've, I've trained staff, and Baltimore is one of them, from Baltimore to Los Angeles. I'm not aware of any agency that, um, that keeps raccoons out of someone's house. If there is an issue with the raccoon that, uh, that needs to be addressed from an animal control perspective, um, we can do that. Um, but the, how animals get inside someone's house, is, is, is it a deficient structure? Not in our expertise. Um, how to keep an animal out of someone's house? Not in our expertise. What we do is address, and that's why our scope, not only here in Philadelphia, but nationally is so limited, it's limited to animals that get into people's living spaces. And um, beyond that, there's, um, there's not a lot outside of that in terms of training and solutions that would satisfy what I think you're asking. Well, no, I, I think you're, you're not really comprehending. You know, the title of your organization is Animal Care and Control. So the key phrase is animal control. And I think being proactive in using some an analysis of targeting locations in the city of Philadelphia where this is more uh, apt to happen, getting information out to constituents, say in February and March, saying it's, you know, this, it's a warmer time of year, be careful how you're maintaining your trash, um, here's some information in reference to how you do that, can help control the issue. Um, but by just saying you're not equipped to do that, I think is an incorrect perspective. I think what you're not doing enough is being providing more of the control aspect to constituents in the city of Philadelphia on how they can be more proactive, and this organization can be more proactive in trying to reduce the possibility of raccoons coming to someone's house. We definitely can do that, Councilman. We could definitely target it for a season and also put the information out um, in a strategic way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Green. Is that a question for Streets and l and Because I think it takes a collective effort for all the city agencies to participate. So it's not surely all on uh, Mr. Vincent Metley and animal control. And so um, for 
the representative from license and inspection, and I want to talk to a representative from streets, just to get an idea of, uh, one, from an LNI standpoint, uh, when you receive the phone call that raccoons are in an abandoned building, uh, what takes place, what's the process in addressing that issue? Um, same thing with streets department, when, when you're code enforcement, I mean, not code enforcement, the um, sweep team, when they're called for sanitation to address the issue of trash, garbage, but specifically regarding um, issues around raccoons, like what's the process, you know, when you get the call from the constituent or the 311 report, and how you go about addressing it? Good morning, Rebecca Good morning. Swanson, Good Director morning, of Rebecca. Planning for the Department of Licenses and Inspections. Um, Councilman, a call for a raccoon in a building would not actually come to LNI. Mm -hmm. As soon as somebody mentions a raccoon or an animal, mm -hmm. that's going to be through one's going to direct that um, mm -hmm. to act or to another uh, another agency. Do you want me to speak about what we do with yes. um, dilapidated with abandoned, abandoned buildings? buildings. With the raccoons. Yeah. So if a if a building is open to trespass, which we consider the first the ground floor. So windows or doors on the first floor that are visible from the street um, or accessible, we will we will go and board them. Um, we use we use plywood. We use kind of special screws that are not supposed to be able to be popped off. Um, that is what we do with a with a vacant or abandoned building. Um, but if there is a report, our our clean and seal team sees that there is trash or the idea that potentially something is inside, whether it be a human or an animal, uh, the appropriate agencies are contacted, whether it's the police or ACT, we will work with them if we believe that there are animals inside. Um, we obviously don't want to seal a building with animals inside of it, um, so there is a partnership there. But I will say anecdotally, the vast majority of properties that we go out to seal, we do not identify, we don't have knowledge that there are animals inside. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. State your name for the record, sir, and your title. Good morning, Councilman Keith morning. Warren, Deputy Commissioner of Streets for Sanitation. Good morning, Keith. How you doing, sir? I'm doing pretty good. Now, just go through the process, Keith. Again, uh, specific calls for animals or raccoons would not really be addressed directly to the streets. Mm -hmm. It would be passed to ACT or Parks or some other agency. But for trash stored improperly, we do receive calls. And we go out and investigate, in most cases, uh, if it's on private property, uh, we we can't really cite. We warn, we educate. If it's in the public right away, we do cite, and it's depend on how it's stored. Uh, most of our education processes around anything dealing with animals is sturdy container with a sealed lid. There's also uh, some education we give out for commercial products that uh, are chemically deterrent to rodents in general, rodents, raccoons, there's some commercial products that you can purchase. But other than that, uh, that's the extent of our involvement with it. Okay, and my, my purpose of asking is again, um, I think a lot of this deals with communication as well amongst the various agencies that play a role. And it obviously it starts with animal control, but obviously um, sanitation from the streets department when you talk about trash plays a role as well as when you talk about the abandoned houses that some of these um, raccoons may um, hang out in, so to speak, play a major role in it as well. So I guess, uh, you know, part of Vincent, you talked about the recommendation of all of the agencies coming together, maybe possibly looking at some type of um, working group amongst yourselves. Um, and I'm not sure who would be that person that would initiate it, but I would think that at least monthly there's like a group of folks around the table, at least having a conversation, if it's not about the campaign, what the issues may be, because if we're getting calls as council members throughout the city of Philadelphia, then obviously, you know, it's an issue. It may not be on the same level as gun violence, or it may not be on the same level of, um, as somebody asked me, a the PFT, school district contract, but it's an issue, but most importantly, it's a quality of life issue. Because when you're a homeowner, you purchase your home, not really trying here, you know, the city can't do anything because you got a raccoon living inside your roof and you don't really have the money to actually pay to get the raccoon taken out of your home. And so that's why, um, for me, this is just as important as any other issue because it's a quality of life issue living here in the city. And depending on where you live at, uh, will determine how it has an impact. But this is something that impacts all neighbors from low income to moderate income 
and people from all different backgrounds here in the city of Philadelphia. And so I just want to state that um, for the record. And so, Councilman Al Tockenberger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Medley, again, uh, you know, we wouldn't be having these hearings if we weren't getting calls. I, I've been here, uh, I'm, I'm new to these council chambers. I've been here less than a year and a half, but I've gotten two calls, one on groundhogs and one on raccoons. And people wouldn't be calling if it's not a major issue. And if you have a raccoon, I can't say it enough, in your house, in your small backyard, if you kids can't go out to play because the, the mother's afraid, we, we just recently had a police officer this morning speak about that they're in her house. And that uh, it, it, that's like a major, major problem. And we need to be able to address that with our resources to help them. I know, I know it's a, a bit beyond the scope, but it changes a whole lot more when it's almost in, well, I wouldn't say almost, in your face. If it's in your house and in, in a small backyard, that is a, 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 a major problem. And I will have to tell you, the constituent does not want to hear about birth control for raccoons, and it doesn't want to hear about peaceful coexistence because that raccoon being there is disturbing their life. And they have to have the resources to pay for the mortgage, to pay for the rent, pay for the food. They don't want to deal with raccoons. They want the city to be of some assistance to them in removing them. So I would say uh, removing raccoons um, is not going to solve the problem. Um, it well, may it is if it's in your house. It, yeah, now, it may solve that individual. Well, intimately, I mean, a backyard. I, well, let me ask you this. Does your backyard, would you consider that affecting the family? If they can't go, if kids can't go out and play because the raccoons are using that as a playground? The, so the... I think there are ways to keep raccoons out of the backyard, and I think um, working with citizens to um, to make their backyard unfriendly to raccoons, um, and and I also do agree that we um, that starting uh, some type of um, coalition or committee to to look at this problem um, to to help the public, um, as our earlier panel, a member of our earlier panel stated. Uh, to be proactive and to address the problem from that level. I would agree that you know human beings should not be in contact with wild animals. Um, and um, the reality is, is that the solutions we have, um, because they are so um, embedded in our community now, um, are, not, are not gonna solve the problem. So I think, Part of it is taking a look at the wildlife in our city, uh, raccoons in our city, and finding ways to coordinate with ourselves and with other wildlife experts to assess the problem and find out what are the best solutions I think would be a, um, something that I am fully in support of. Well, I, I would love to work with you. I would also like to um, uh, help in providing the resources to deal with this because if it wasn't a problem, we wouldn't be getting a call and we wouldn't be having these hearings. And I will be very direct to you, in all due respect, for you to say that if we gave you the resources, you would refer them to <laughs> cats and dogs. Well, that may be a problem too, but I've yet to get a call on cats and dogs. I've gotten two calls on raccoons and on groundhogs. Uh, the, and, and that's because the reason why I say I would divert those is because cats and dogs are, are in closer proximity to humans than anyone. So some type of disease outbreak is going to be much more um, of an impact to the community if it's a cat or a dog than it would be for a wild animal. Because at least with raccoons, people have the instant signal, I need to stay away from this animal. Um, well, not when it's in, yes, I agree. And, and, I, and, and I don't disagree with the answer you just gave, but I do disagree that once it's in your house, that's, that's in your face, you know, and, and they want that matter resolved. If you talk to someone, I'm sure you have, yes. but I have too. If, if, if a raccoon is in your house, you're not going to be really uh, want to hear about you should live in coexistence and you should have birth control for the raccoon. Well, they, they want that animal out. Peaceful coexistence doesn't mean that the, you, keep, you allow the raccoon to stay in your house. Um, it's, uh, it, it's more about um, looking at the solution to the individual problem um, at the house. And so we're not saying to allow a raccoon, I'm not saying to allow a raccoon to live in, in the house, um, but we are going to see them. Uh, they are going to be uh, 
in the community or in the wooded areas. Um, See, seeing them is, is one thing, and I get that. Uh, and some people might get upset with that, but actually where they prevent you from using part of your, your, uh, your, your backyard or your house, that is a major problem. Yeah, I would agree with that, Councilman. And there, there are ways to make it um, very unpleasant for raccoons. And we can, we can definitely, um, I can work with the uh, city departments and the uh, managing director's office to um, take a look at that and uh, propose some solutions. Mr. Medley, thank you. You're Mr. welcome. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Um, that's all for the panel, but Vincent, I do want to thank you for taking time um, out of your schedule and being here. I also just want to thank you for just being straight up and talking about the solutions and where there are, where there are places where we don't have a solution, um, as opposed to just sitting here and giving us the whole rosy picture of how it's going to be addressed. So I do appreciate that. I respect your honesty as well um, in terms of how we can find ways to address the issue. What I would like to do also is I'll follow with Councilman Al Tockenberg as well as Councilman Woman Helen Kim and, and Councilman Green, if he would like to as well, to figure out you know, how we move forward. I know you made some recommendations about the public information campaign. I do want to recommend um, that you take in consideration doing your own working group. We can support it as council members, but I firmly believe that everyone needs to be at the table. L&I, Streets Department, Parks and Rec, Managing Director's Office, at least so y'all can all be on the same page on how we're going to go about and address this issue for the long term. And so um, just want to thank all of you for being here on this particular panel. I want to next call up. We have two representatives from the Pennsylvania Gaming Commission who would like to um, add some input to this particular topic as well. And so I'm going to ask them to come up and state their name and their title um, for the record because they wanted to make some official um, statements for the record as well. Good morning, Officer Check, uh, Wildlife Conservation Officer Check, 637, Pennsylvania Game Commission, assigned to Philadelphia County. You can start, sir. Okay. Um, I've been doing this job for 18 years in this county. Um, the, the city's blessed with 9,000 acres of public park land. That's not including recreation department or private property. So animals are going to, wild animals, uh, are, are very much a part of this landscape. Um, they do belong here. Um, and peaceful coexistence is great. If something is in your house, in the living space of your house, that is a priority. Uh, whether it be police, animal control, or us would respond to something like that. I'm one officer for the entire county. I uh, work well with ACT on, on many occasions. We work together. If I can't get there, they get there. Um, if, it is in, if, it's, if it's in your house but is not in your living space, yes, of course, that is a priority as well, but not as much as a priority. Uh, we can't come out and trap every raccoon that's in someone's attic or in someone's yard or someone's, that gets into someone's trash that they don't want. Um, in a defensive act, uh, their job basically is, well, until recently, was cats and dogs is, is, is their job as far as I understand. Wildlife became like a collateral part of their job, so they got a permit with us to, to do the job. Some of the folks that are talking about trapping and, and the price of trapping with private contractors, uh, it's, a, it's a private industry. So one guy may charge 100 bucks, another guy may charge 500 bucks. There are licensed folks that have a permit from the Game Commission to do this. Uh, they're sort of responsible to us. There are a lot of folks out there that aren't. And I don't know, with the cost of things, some people come out and trap and remove. Some people come out and trap and repair. Or, or look at the uh, property and say, you need to do this, you need to do that, like ACT was saying about their, uh, beyond their scope. Um, I, I didn't have anything really prepared. I saw this last night on the news, figured I'd better come down here and listen. Thank you. Um, so there's a lot of different issues, and one of the major issues is the, uh, when you call somebody, it usually takes sometimes two days to get to me when it's a wildlife issue because they call ACT or they call about the trash, when, like I think the department's both said here, once you say animal, pfft, uh, that's not us. I'm not saying they're passing the buck, but it's, it's the animal, yes. it's the trash, it's, it's the lane. abandoned building, yes. 
it's everybody's issue mm -hmm. together. Um, one of the other things is that when you trap an animal yourself, you, you can do this yourself like the officer said, you can go get a, have a heart trap if it's causing damage to your property, you can trap it. Now people say, what the heck do I do with it? Or they trap something they don't want to touch. And I've dealt with raccoons for 18 years in this job. Some are docile and some are a nightmare. Uh, and I know what I'm doing. So I can see the public's issue with that. The state law says that if it's a rabies vector species, which possums, raccoons, and groundhogs are, they're not to be re-released anywhere. Where are you going to re-release these things? Mm. You know, take them down to the park? Now we have 8,000 raccoons in the park. Uh, they're just going to come back to your neighborhood. Or preserve, there's no preserve that just has a bunch of raccoons that says, yep, yeah, bring the city, bring us your 400 raccoons. Um, that, that's, what, that's euthanizing. That's, that's the that's option. That's what the issue is. That's the option, period. Time to the resources. If, if they're contracted, if, if a person has a permit from the Game Commission, by law, that's what they do. Mm. That's what they're supposed to do. If they go re-release things, you're supposed to have the landowner's permission where you're re-releasing. Like he said about the populations of raccoons mm -hmm. uh, or any other animal. Uh, if it's a rabies vector species, we can't take a problem or an issue. It's a rabies vector species, meaning it can, can carry rabies. Not every raccoon has rabies. All these raccoons that are out right now, they don't have rabies. Not all of them. Maybe a few do. But they're out right now because they're having babies. It's springtime, and they're out foraging for food because it was mom and dad two weeks ago. Now it's mom and dad and five babies. So they're out during the day. Just because it's out during the day doesn't mean it has rabies. It's a good sign that it may, but that's not the only contributing factor. So if um, the option is to kill them, you, when a person traps them, they're to be killed. And somebody said here about Luzerne County. In Luzerne County, you, you can go over to your trap and you, uh, it, uh, an approved method of euthanasia is suffocation, drowning, asphyxiation, or gunshot. Now in the city of Philadelphia, we have some rules about firing guns. And if you unlawfully discharge a firearm in the city, that's a problem. But a lawful discharge of a firearm in the city is, it, is not illegal. So if, if a homeowner were to take a pellet gun or a 22 and dispatch the animal in their yard, that would not be an unlawful discharge of a firearm because they're lawfully discharging the firearm at that animal in the trap. I know we probably don't want to get into that in the city, but there are ranges in the city. There's a police range that they fire their guns. There's private ranges. So just shooting a gun in the city is not unlawful, so to speak. And I, I, I can see your eyes. I, I don't want everybody going out and shooting the raccoon that's in the trap. I'm not talking about shooting yeah. raccoons off the wires and stuff like that. I'm talking about it's in the trap. It's a controlled shot right down into the ground. Mm -hmm. But that is a legal way of doing it in the other 66 counties. Let's just say that. You can take a trash can, fill it with water, take the trap, dump it in there, the animal drowns. That's an approved method. Or carbon monoxide. I'm sure that's sure. how ACT does it. They take it, they put it in a chamber, they put the carbon monoxide on, animal suff basically suffocates. So they're the options, re-releasing okay. and things like that. I don't want to take too much of your time. If somebody has questions, um, I, I want to mention another thing about ACT with their collateral duties of when they said they want to take care of the cats and dogs. Um, they get all these calls. If people were to bring it there, they should put it down, and I think that's what they said that they do. Um, that should be a viable method. I don't see how that takes up too many resources. If someone's bringing it there and you're just putting it in the chamber and turning the gas on, they shouldn't store it. They shouldn't keep it. They don't, they don't need, he mentioned about rehabbers. If an animal's injured, it can be taken to a rehabber, not ACT. ACT can take it, get it out of the person's possession because it's injured. You don't want the people having it. And if it's injured, they can take it to a rehabber, which is separate from ACT. They just get it there, same thing I do, dump it off, and the rehabber takes care of it. If the animal is in condition where it needs to be dispatched or it's going to be euthanized, it should arrive at ACT and be euthanized within minutes. It's not like we're thinking about what are we going to do with this animal. It's a rabies vector species. It was bought in a trap, put it in the chamber, and done, and dispose of it. I could probably go on for another half hour, but I'll put it there And if anybody has any questions. Another big issue with this, excuse me, one more, is the, the cat issue in Philadelphia where the, we have all the hooches and people feed the cats. And the reason I, I, I know you're focusing on raccoons, but what happens is in the evening, all those cat hooches become foxes come to those, raccoons and possums, and eat the food there. They interact with the domestic cat population, and most of the people that go to these 
hooches. When they see the raccoon, they could care less about it. They want it out of there. But now the cat has been in a fight with the, with the mm-hmm. wild animal. The rabies then could transfer to the cat. Everybody wants to save the cat. I'm not a cat hater. I'm just saying everybody wants to save the cat, then goes up and touches the cat, which now has rabies. Mm. So that's a big issue with somebody said about feeding. And we have cat hooches all over the city. I that's good information for the record. So there's much more I can t- discuss with you, mm. you know, at your offices or whatnot, or if anybody has questions. Um, excuse me, a few folks okay. have questions if you have time. Thank you. Councilman Tappenberger? Well, well, thank you very, very much for being here, and I think uh, having the Game Commission involved is, is very important to this, uh, this problem. And it is a problem, otherwise we wouldn't be having these hearings. I mean, people see it as a, a real problem. Education, I think, is a way to resolve it, but also I still, my heart goes out for the person that, you know, has a, a raccoon in their house that is uh, hell on earth, and the, and the, and the young mother who... Uh, we, we learned could not uh, let her children out in the yard because the raccoons were, were there. Sure. And, and, and that is a real problem. A couple questions for you. Are, are you uh, in charge of all of Philadelphia County? Correct. And any other counties or just Philadelphia? Uh, I have collateral duties in Delaware County right now. Well, you now. collaborate, but your jurisdiction really is Philadelphia. My, my assigned county is Philadelphia. Okay. Okay. And do you, do you by chance, live in Philadelphia? Or? Uh, I did for a few years ago. I live in Shelton right. right now. Okay. Well, you're you're familiar with it. I was born and raised here. Yes. Okay. For okay. twenty six well, years. I think it's important. I think people want to know your your telephone number. And before you leave here, I'd like to be able to contact you. Oh, we get the calls too. It's six one zero nine two six thirty one thirty six. Six one zero nine two six thirty one thirty six. Hold on. Six one zero nine two six thirty one thirty six. Thirty one. Our dispatchers will give information prioritize the calls and if it's in somebody's house running around the basement you know they'll, they'll give that job to us I work eight hours a day 40 hours a week there's one of us and I have two part-time officers uh, mr. councilman O'Neill's office uh, I think Pam's her name or something but she, she's calling me all the time from I mean, from her office in the sure. Northeast okay how many calls do you think you get on wildlife that is intruding into uh people's homes or private areas, you know, meaning a small oh, backyard. Da- almost on a daily basis. I mean, I get people calling and say the fox ran through my yard, and I call and I call them back, and they, what happened? It runs through my yard at 6 a.m. in the morning when I leave for work. Okay, well, that that's not an issue or problem to us if it's just no, normally run. I get people calling, they don't want the hawks eating the birds at their bird feeders. So when you say when I get wildlife-related calls related to humans, I mean, that's what our business is, so it's like almost all our... Almost all our calls are like Because there really that. isn't, uh, if I could ask on this, just for my own edification, there really is any legal hunting in Philadelphia. Oh, yes, there is. Oh, there is? Oh, absolutely. Legal? Yes. Where? On private property with bow and arrows. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Okay. A lot of hunting in the Northeast. I know that's part of your district. Right. Well, well at large, but I live okay. in the Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I live in the no, Northeast. No, no, no. Right. It's, it's, uh, okay. no, on private property, you can hunt with bow and arrow for deer, and uh, you can hunt waterfowl along the... Schuylkill River and the Delaware River waterfowl. There's right. not a lot. There's not a raccoon hunting in Philadelphia. You can't really do that no, because understand. there's not like anywhere to do it. Yes. Uh, mostly trapping. People would trap raccoons for their pelts. Okay. All and right. they sell their pelts. Fur trappers well, do that well, in most of the other counties. Understood. Well, I look forward to, to working with you to kind of resolve this problem because once again, we wouldn't be having these hearings if uh, if there wasn't a need. Oh, and there I, is a I, need. Absolutely. I mean, we can narrow the call rac- raccoon calls down, but when you say wildlife interacting with people, that's 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 every call I get just about. Thank you, Mr. Yep, Chairman. You're Thank, you. Thank you, Councilman Derek Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I wish um, representatives from the city were still here because I think you provide some good information. Uh, especially, I know we have a, a very big feral cat issue in the city of Philadelphia, and I think as you were talking, it made me think of there are people I know in my a neighborhood in Mount Airy who have a you know, very strong um, um, love for cats and they put out food. I know uh, a property not that far from me um, is actually a commercial business where they put out food for cats on a regular basis, which the concept of that food attracting not only the cats but also the raccoons and then having an interaction. I think part of the issue, and this is why I wish that um, um, ACT was still here, because helping to educate, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't say part part of the issue is educating um, people in all the in all throughout the entire city that when you put out food for cats, that can also attract 
raccoons and also cause a possibility of rabies. And I think people are not aware of that and that dynamic. I think that goes back to the public education issue that we need to do a better job that when you're putting out food for cats, you could also be inviting other type of wildlife into your community. And I don't think people have that perspective. Correct, that and they're not there the at, at 2 in the morning or 11 at night when the other critters are there right. fighting or trying to get some of that food. Right. And with ACT, I mean, in our position and some of the laws, they, they catch the cats, they spade and neuter them, then they re-release them. So right. they're still getting fed. Right. They probably should be catching the cats and doing something else with them rather than uh, right. I get what they're doing so they don't spread population. But people are still housing. Those houses aren't only cat houses. There's, there's a place up in the northeast where the foxes come there all the time and are eating some of the cats. Right. And there's coyotes in the city. I don't know if anybody's familiar with no, it. There's coyotes. We have turkeys. You know, we had a bear come through here last, uh -huh. in the Wissahickon last fall uh -huh. or last spring. I'm sorry. Right. But I just think that's something from a public education perspective. Uh, I know parts of the city that people need to have a better understanding that people just think, well, we're doing a nice thing by feeding cats and putting out food, but that also may be attracting other wildlife to their home. Right. Correct. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Any other questions for the administration? No? Okay. So at this particular time, we're going to have public testimony. So we're going to call up the next panel. Thank you very much. Stacy DiStefano, Viola Mason, and Ali Bettis. Sure. Hi, my name is Stacy DiStefano. I live in Point Breeze. I took this picture yesterday afternoon, but it really could have been at any moment, uh, just about any day of the week. That's from my balcony in my bedroom uh, in the front how'd of my how'd home. How did I get on the roof? I mean, on the balcony. That's on my balcony. Yep. So I was standing in the bedroom in daylight and uh, about three feet in front of me and trying to get in through the screen door. So I can't open my screen door at night. I can't sleep with the windows open. Um, about two years ago, we moved to Point Breeze. I never thought that I would worry about raccoons. I can tell you there was an abandoned home behind our house when we moved in, and that was demolished, and that's the first time we saw one. So we just figured, you know, from the demolition and things got moved around. So we called ACT, and, um, you know, they basically said they couldn't do anything because it was coming in our backyard. So we paid the trapper, came out um, about $400 twice, Two raccoons took them away. And then on the second time, he said, well, you have a lot of overgrown trees in, in the alley behind your house on your block. So it's like creating a highway system. And I didn't see anyone address that today. So the overgrown trees from the alleys to the roofs are actually just creating a very easy path for the raccoons to get onto the roof. Um, in addition to that, there are several vacant houses on our block that you can see them coming in and out of very easily. So it's a breeding ground there. We actually called the city to have the trees pruned back and then um, was told that wasn't possible so we paid to have the tree pruned back so at least now there is no direct access to our roof but from my balcony which is my neighbor's roofs uh, every almost every single day that is now an incidence um, I was frustrated when I came here and now I'm actually angry because what I'm hearing is um, the responsibility is now on the homeowner so it's a problem, I believe, through city policy that um, the trees are overgrown, there's abandoned buildings not being dealt with, it's a breeding ground for an infestation of raccoons. That's not peaceful coexistence. Being three feet in my own bedroom and watching four raccoons on a regular basis try to get in my home where there's no food, uh, it's a new house, there's no dilapidated structure, there's no holes, that's not safe. There's 12 children on my block, that's not safe. Um, so now I found out today, sitting here, that in addition to having to pay for the traps, to pay for trees to be pruned, now I have to um, somehow figure out how to kill something once it's in my yard, uh, which is frightening and not something I want my and my neighbors to have to deal with. Um, I'm very concerned about that. I, I also, with all due respect, um, I'm going to liken this to something, I like analogies. So. 
If there was a hole in the roof in this room, and every time it rained, water came in, I don't think the solution would be the city would be buying buckets to fill the water. Mm -hmm. I think the city would want to fix the hole. Sure. So what I'm hearing today with the public education campaign and traps and palm cards and neighborhood talks, you're buying buckets. We need to solve the problem. The problem is an infestation of these animals in dilapidated structures. Um, my neighborhood is not heavy with trash. Um, we don't have a lot of abandoned buildings, but we have some. Um, but it shouldn't be on, the, on the, the residents to fix this problem, and that's what I'm really angry about today. I, I do think um, we are way past public education around this. And what I would suggest is maybe a pilot project where you're reallocating some of the money for public education and, and those phone calls uh, to maybe take a section of the city, prune back the trees. Um, you know, if, if the city doesn't want to sell a vacant building, that's fine, but then the city should demolish it. The city should create an uh, environment where animals can't live there. Um, it, it, it is a public health campaign, and it's not about rabies. It's about not being able to go outside of your house, and that's frightening. I mean, I literally cannot open my sliding glass doors in my bedroom because just yesterday, while I was standing there, four raccoons were trying to get in my screen. This is a big raccoon. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And I grew up in South Philly all my life, and I thought I was like, kind of tough guy at one time, and I ran into a raccoon in Gray's Ferry, mm -hmm. no, I was no. not tough as I thought I was. So and, you know, I just I, want to let you know, and yeah. I'm, not, I'm saying this in all seriously, you know, honestly, that I feel um, exactly what you're saying. And I got a, I have a too friendly two-year-old son that I would not want to have interact with Absolutely not. Age. Absolutely not. So part of that issue um, around public education, it, it seems to me, with all due respect to, to the testimony before, um, a little bit condescending. I mean, we're not feeding them. You know, we're, we're not strewing trash around. We're not um, creating an environment where they're welcome. And, and from that photo, you can see, because it's daylight and because I'm standing two feet from them, when you switch the lights on and off, they're also in my backyard, but honestly, you know, that is where the trash is, so that's a little more understandable. Certainly not on a roof, and not on a balcony. Um, you turn the lights on, they just look right back at you. You open the door, they actually get up on all fours. There is no fear. So it's not about educating the public on what to do. We now have domesticated city animals. Um, they're not afraid of people. They're actually annoyed with you if you're in their way. Um, for that mother and baby to stand there, well, I, I have on my phone about 12 other photos. They, didn't even, they weren't even remotely phased by my presence in front of them in broad daylight. So we're beyond public education, and I think we need to address the heart of the problem. Um, the, roof, the roof that's leaking you know, is how do we reduce the population of these animals in abandoned buildings. It's not about how do we tell people how to trap and drown and kill and BB guns. That's, that's alarming. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's something that, um, as a, res a resident of, this, of Point Breeze and of the city, I don't want to hear that it's my responsibility to do something mm -hmm. about this. Thank you. Ma'am, just state your name for the record and begin. Yes, my name's Viola Mason, and I'm not really here about the raccoon problem. I just could hear the similarity to some of the other problems I deal with. Uh, I live in southwest Philly. Um, I'm very well aware and work within the community cat and the trap neuter return program, so there are answers in terms of cats in your neighborhood. Um, People should, in fact, be schooled that they don't leave food out. I'm well aware that that should not happen. Um, the reason why I'm here, though, is the comparison to a problem I've been having with pit bulls running loose and what you do about that, because I had an awful time getting any agency in the city to respond to vicious pit bulls in my backyard, which is fenced and had a locked gate. Ma'am, I, I would like to do this, if you don't mind. Can we keep it raccoon focused? And if you have a specific issue someone regarding... Else introduced the, uh, someone else introduced the cat problem, but you also invited me to speak, so... On the topic of raccoons, I think the person who... Well, I've said my the, piece, so I'm perfectly glad to go ahead and, and shut up. No, I wouldn't say shut up. I would just say if you can try to keep it toward the raccoons. But go ahead, ma'am. Go ahead. What is it you want me to say? You're, you're finished? Well, I, I do have a quick question. <laughs> sure. 
Sure. <laughs> And, and, and we just did talk quickly about the intersection of uh, where, where folks cats. are feeding cats. Mm -hmm. If uh, this council were to propose an ordinance uh, against that practice of feeding cats outside, would you oppose that or would you be supportive? I would oppose it. You would I understand that it is in fact legal at this time. It is what? Legal. It is legal. To feed cats. Outside? Yes. yes. Okay. And if it became illegal, you would be opposed to that? Yes. Okay. So I just wanted to know that. Okay. Okay, ma'am. State your name. Are you finished, ma'am? Well, I have nothing to say about raccoons. And okay, go ahead I'm with finished. the cats. Well, Dog, you said, right? I, I don't want to give you a full lecture on cats. I believe that the city does need to become more educated about the community cat and the trap, neuter, and return program. I have put a lot of my time and a great deal of my money, which has saved ACT, who otherwise would have been responsible, um, a great deal of their budget. And I would like at least minimal appreciation for it. And I met up with the reverse when I tried to deal with the pit bull problem of vicious pit bulls in my backyard, fenced, gated, et cetera, in which nobody seemed to think it was their business to deal with it. Thank you. Anything else, ma'am? No, that'll be all. Thank you very much. Thank you for your service. Next. Good morning, everyone. I'm here about the raccoons and the possums. And as I said in my note, the rats too, but I can handle them, They're not that big. So the problem with the raccoons that I have. Yeah, can you try to keep it raccoon focused, please, if you don't yeah, mind? Yeah, I am. Okay. Okay. So the raccoon problem that I have is there are two giant raccoons on my block, and I think they may have children. They come out day or night, and I watch my grandchildren during the day, and like the young lady says, I can't let them go outside and play, and they're wondering why they can't, and I'm trying to explain to them that there are two raccoons out there. One of my grandchildren thinks, actually thinks it's a dog, because they're like huge. I'm not opposed to killing any animal, because I have a dog. I just need someone to remove them into a safer environment for them, so that they are away from me. <laughs> okay. So I thank you, and I appreciate you. And Mr. Johnson, I appreciate your office, because every time I call, I get results. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. So before, you state your name for the record? Yes. I just want to say to Ms. Stefano, correct? Close. Close. Okay. So I just want to state just for the record, and, and I know Vincent Metley is in the back. He runs ACTT Animal Control Unit. Hopefully, um, he wants to look, hopefully there will be a working group to look at. Um, you got L and I that deals with the abandoned houses, and you have streets that specifically deals with um, all things trash related as well as working to clean out alleyways. Like that would be the comprehensive approach. That was the sole purpose of inviting all of them here today because I would think that, you know, just from a leadership standpoint, everybody would be at the table, but it, it only happens if it's a priority. Let me just be quite frank with you. When it's a priority, all the people are at the table working um, in sync together to addressing the issue. And so hopefully that will be the perspective uh, moving forward and myself and my colleagues up here, we'll work in partnership um, with um, Animal Control Unit, Mr. Vincent Melly, to see how we can be supportive of that process um, moving forward. But I definitely recognize, and I live in South Philadelphia all my life, um, from a kid until now. And again, I don't remember having any raccoons growing up in South Philly. And here's the interesting part. We had more abandoned buildings before Point Breeze had development, and I haven't seen a raccoon. I mean, Point Breeze didn't always look the way it is today, and we didn't have raccoons. Actually, we had way more abandoned homes um, and um, alleyways with with probably trees and debris in it, and I don't remember being seeing raccoons, but this is a different environment. But I do know from a cleanliness standpoint, we have a role to play it's from the city in terms of addressing those type of issues. And so um, your remarks were definitely on point, and we will work to make sure that um, there's a level of follow through moving forward for the long haul. So thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. 
Larry Henderson, Anthony Jones, and Pamela Thomas. Please state your name for the record and begin. My name is Dr. Anthony Jones, and I live in the East Oak Lane section of Philadelphia. And hearing uh, all the people here today that have come before me, as well as I am quite familiar with uh, Officer Chech, who's been to my house twice, and I'm familiar with um, most of the people at uh, Act Philly. About eight years ago, I started trapping raccoons because they, be, they were such a menace in the neighborhood. So I'm also a block captain was on the board of Oak Lane Community Action Association. And I was the chairman of crime and safety in that district, working with the 35th district uh, and Captain McCluskey at that time. So we realized that there was a problem with this and neighbors, we, all, we tried bringing in people that we would pay to you know, get them, then neighbors decided this is very expensive. Like you know, we had a range of about two hundred dollars to up to about seven hundred and fifty dollars. So, took it upon myself. I said, okay, you know, let me do some research and figure out some things. So, on my block of the sixty-six hundred block of North Thirteenth Street, I purchased traps, researched how to trap raccoons, and actually got very good at it. Act Philly would pick the raccoons up. We didn't have a problem. Then, I guess about three years ago, uh, and actually as much as late as last year, like I received some things. Officer Chech uh, appeared at my house because somehow it was stated that I was trapping and skinning the raccoons. And I couldn't figure that out because of the fact that Act Philly were picking up the raccoons. So I don't know how I could skin them if they had them. But anyway, so we you know, moved forward. And what I've heard here today is that this is a problem. And really, I think, OK, education is one part of it. But what about community involvement? What about you know, if people say in the community, I am willing to trap if you're willing to pick up? And I think a partnership in this situation might you know, really help. Now, uh, as the woman before mentioned about raccoons being on her, you know, balcony, and, you know, it, it's crazy. I have them in the backyard. Um, they're all over the place. We have senior citizens. Most people are afraid to go out in the yards. We have lush yards, very similar to, I think, what Councilman was saying, you know, like Mount Airy, very big, very deep, wide, green space. And, no, you're sitting out there. I've been out there grilling, and raccoons have come by. You know, just like, hey, what's on the menu? And it's a little crazy. So once again, I'd like to say to the city of Philadelphia, as well as to Act Philly, how are we going to solve this problem? And yes, we do need a partnership. I think people in the community are willing to work with you. As I was willing to work with Act Philly, and I had three traps that were going all the time. This is how many raccoons were catching that were you know so good that um, they really thought that I guess I was a professional trapper and I was just like no I just want to get these things out of the neighborhood as I had talked to people in Act Philly they had said to me we, we had good conversations and we had not so good conversations but as it was stated you know we're never going to get rid of them I understand that I get it but a reduction in the population I think is also helpful and that's sort of where our community stand at this point is let's reduce the population uh, of these animals because yes, as we heard today, people do not want to live with them in their backyards. You don't want them hanging out while you're grilling and you know you're entertaining friends and things of that nature. So uh, hopefully, 
this panel, and I thank you for taking on this issue because it is a quality of life issue. In uh, East Oak Lane, we have dealt with numerous quality of life issues. So I thank you, uh, City Council and Chairman, for taking on this issue very much so. And I will bring back information to my community who's having elections on Wednesday of this week and, you know, sort of tell them what you're thinking and what's going on with City Council to help us, the citizens of Philadelphia, with this issue. Thank you, Councilman Tottenberger. Uh, doctor, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and testimony. About how many uh, raccoons do you uh, capture in a year? I go on their cycle in the spring, and I go on their cycle in the fall. But I do catch some in between during the summer. And I'd say at any given time, I could catch anywhere from six to eight. OK. That's, that's you know? And, and these are all uh, captured on your property? On my property. That's these a lot of raccoons. Coming, coming through. You clearly hear them at night. You know, I'm a musician uh, by trade, so listening to sounds. And now I know exactly the chitter chatter of raccoons as they're talking back and forth. Mm. And when I have the windows open at night, you can clearly hear them in the backyard. It was mentioned about leaving on lights and, and things of that nature. You know, we looked through a lot of that uh, as a community. And people were doing things of that nature. And as the previous woman had stated, you, you know what? They're used to it. They're just, this just does not phase them. Motion, light detectors, it don't, they, they, they realize they're smart creatures. Right. And they realize, you know what? That's, that's not really going to do anything until they maybe see a human. Sometimes they move away. Sometimes they don't. They get so used to you. So... It is a, an issue when I'm catching that many. I think one time they came out and there were two raccoons in one trap. Wow. That's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that, that is interesting. I, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would have to say, I think, uh, and, and Doctor, if you would want to be uh, involved in this, if we did have an ad hoc committee working out these difficulties, your ex expertise and experience would be very much welcome, I believe, on that committee. I, I would be honored uh, as I travel around the world in various you know capacities and doing different things i always promote the city of philadelphia i love my city don't want to move out of the city you know would like to just you know resolve issues so i'm yeah, always you, open you'd to, like, to you'd like that peace in your own backyard and right that that's all i want it's not asking for much <laughs> it's not asking for much no i don't think it is either thank you mr uh, thank you doctor thank you mr. thank you councilman next person please Yes, hello, good afternoon. My Can name is your name? Yeah, go ahead. Pamela Thomas, and I am a block captain in Frankfurt, uh, 2000 block of Margaret in Torzell. Now, I've had several people come to me pertaining to the raccoon issue, and it's major in my block. The other day, I'm going to say about two weeks ago, I was standing outside talking to my neighbor, I'm like, what is that? She said, that's a raccoon. I said, what? And she says, oh, yeah, it's a family in the back of this property right here. I said, are you kidding me? So when they procreate, I don't know how many babies they have. So you figure if it's a family behind a house, then you have Torsdale, which goes this way. There's a family over there. Then you have an alleyway of where I live at. They're all back there. So, of course, me being a block captain, everybody, well, what do I do about the raccoons? Who do I call? I said, call 311. So, call 311. No, that's not our issue. You have to call, um, you know, the animal. I said, okay. So, what do you do? I mean, sometimes I don't even want to go outside in the back because I don't know if one is going to be back there. I have a backyard. And, and there are kids that play in the alleyway. So that's another concern. And people in my block, I know there's an issue with the trash. And when I get home, there will be notes going in everybody's door because I tend to let people know what's going on. On my way coming down here, I texted the neighbor. I said, listen, I'm going to this raccoon thing. 
him telling me the other day, talking to him, I said, well, what's going on with the lady's trash across the street? Why is it all over the street? Oh, that was a raccoon. I says, okay. I still need to talk to her about her trash. Because why would you... If you know it's a raccoon issue. So, but my only thing is, please get help. We need help with the raccoons. It's, it's a major problem. Because any two times you standing, talking to somebody, and it just walks right out. To, no, that's, mm -mm, no, that's not good. So, thank you. No, thank you for your service. Next, sir. State your name for the record, please. Uh, my name is Larry Henderson, and I live in the West Oak Lane area, 15 on the block of uh, Nidro. Mm -hmm. And I've been having this problem since 1985 with these raccoons. And I've had, I guess, no less than 25 that I had to have removed, me personally. It's in a cost of... Um, in excess of $15,000 worth of damage done to my property. Trees had to be cut down, and it just keeps going on and on. So listening to the paneling of different people that were up here earlier, apparently none of them have had to try to call any of the city agencies for assistance because you call this number, well, wait a minute, let me transfer you to this number, then they transfer you to another number, and after about 30 minutes of this, you just sort of like give up and you go do what you gotta do. And uh, what I did, I had to go buy these half a heart traps. And luckily, um, I had some people that I worked with. They would come out. They lived in another county. They would take them out there. I didn't care what they did with them. As long as they brought my trap back, because I had to go out and buy that. But um, the, 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 this, you're talking about an animal that really is at the top of the food chain in the city. And it is not afraid of anything, anybody. Uh, you're talking about the trash cans. The city of Toronto, Canada, I think they did a survey. They did, I think it took them about six months to find a trash can that they could not get in. And they pretty much did like what the city did with the recycling bins. They said, okay, these are the trash cans that we use. We recommend everybody gets them. They have them at Home Depot, but these trash cans are in excess of $100. So this whole thing is very, very expensive. As far as them climbing, the first time I knew I had a problem at my house, a lady says, there he is, and I thought she was pointing at me because it's like six in the morning. It was a, actually a raccoon scaling up the side of the wall, carrying a younger raccoon that I didn't know I had a problem. They actually got up and pulled away some of the wood away from the ease area. And that's where they were going in at. But she was actually just climbing, scaling up the side of the wall. And just like you, uh, Councilman Johnson, I never seen these problems in the city. I grew up in North Philly and in my area that I grew up at, they have problems. And you just go like, where did all these things come from? And I would like to, I'm sorry, I don't want to mispronounce your name, but I tell you what you do when you hear something in the wall and you're like, eh, maybe if I ignore it, it goes away. And they get the scratching and they come through that sheet, walk, sheet rock in the wall, you got to take some action. And that's happened to me. So, you know, when people say, oh, I don't know, you know, they put a nice name on it, euthanize. Well, you're trying to treat them like you would a mouse. You put them in a mouse trap, the mouse trap is there to kill a mouse, and that's what you got to do with these raccoons. They're not going to back away from anything. So, and the only person I heard here today that actually had some good information was the last gentleman. I think he was with the state. Um, Gate, gate he, he gave control. the most valid gate thing. Control. You cannot, you, you know, um, treat them like they're just going to go away. If you do this, you do that, you do that. They don't go away. No, they don't. I, I, I will say this, though. I mean, I guess depending on who you is, who you are, at least everybody not going to pick up a gun or try to go outside and s suffocate or... That. shoot with a pellet gun or shoot with a real gun or I'm just being honest with you I mean I don't I mean to each his own because I know you you said you did some trapping I'm not trapping bottom line that's not what I'm into right. I'm not dealing with no rodents that's not how I'm going to address it but I, to each his own I think there's a variety of different ways but I think right. this is this is good because it gives us a view 
of everything that's going on out here, and hopefully there will be a comprehensive approach to say, okay, here's what the options are in terms of us moving forward. But I'm just saying, me personally, that's not where my head is at in terms of me and, pulling out. And know, see, your whole, and so forth. it doesn't have to be an abandoned property. It just has to be something that they can uh, either pull away from, say, like siding or wooding. Oh, Whatever yeah. it is, they will pull away from that and gain access to the property that you live in. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be an abandoned property for them to continue doing whatever they want to do. No, we agree. We so, agree on that. Councilman Toppenberger. Thank you, Chairman. I thank you on your leadership for bringing the, all these folks to the table. I think the ideas and thoughts came out are, are pretty good. And I just also wanted to say I thank the panel that was here. I, I have no comment other than you wanted to know how to pronounce my last name. It's yes. Taubenberger. 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 Long Germany. Taubenberger. But I'll get you a card before you Okay, leave. thank you. Because I think this is a problem working on together with the leadership of the chair and other council people here, Councilman Green, Councilman, Councilwoman Gim. I think we can, and Councilman O'Neill was here as well. We can, we can resolve this problem. Or at least control Put it. Put it in. Because we don't, we, don't, we, we don't need to have our neighbors and our citizenry sharing their homes with raccoons. I am sorry. I, I, that's, my love for animals goes so far. And that ends right there where they yeah. have to share a home. At, at one time, the city had a vector control. They handed like um, uh, these type of problems with rats and whatnot. I don't know what happened to them, but I tried to contact it initially in the beginning. And they were like, well, they live on the other side of Brewer Street. You don't have a problem. I said, no, I'm on the other side. I didn't know they knew to stop at Brewer Street and not come over, you know? See, I'm glad we're having a hearing because I'm not. Excuse me, Mr. Metley, and thank you for sticking around. Um, do you know about vector control that the city of Philadelphia once formally had? And, and what's the status as to do we have it now or don't have it? Can you come on up? Okay. Thank you I was just told it's under the health department, but can you clarify it for me, Mr. Metley? And then uh, we're going to wrap up. Go ahead, sir. Uh, Chairman, we do have a vector control. Um, I do not believe that they, they address raccoons at this time. Okay. I'm glad. So they would, they would handle what? Rats? So yeah, is the health department still here? No? She left already? Yes. Oh, you're here. Go ahead, sir. Can you help us out, please? Sure. Hi, right, Dave Wilson, Deputy Managing Director for Community and Culture. Uh, the Vector Department is part of the Health Department, and they handle uh, for its rats and uh, mosquitoes is the, the, the vector piece of that that they cover. So how can we add raccoons to that population? Well, Does it, what classifies as a, a rodent or well, animal that comes under your jurisdiction? I, I think that basically how everything is how everything is, is, is situated right now, that we have a way in which we deal with raccoons. It's just that it's in a limited scope, right? And I think that's what this hearing has really kind of pretty much outlined for us, that how do we deal with the, 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 the rampant problem with raccoons? And I think that what, the, what I've taken away from the committee here today is that we need to, one, coordinate better within the administration mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, work with with one another to address the problem as well as the outreach to the community whether that is i think councilman taubenberger talked about an ad hoc committee or, or something to that extent mm -hmm. so that's what i've taken away here that's what we have spoken about earlier prior to this to this to this hearing so i think the structure is how it is already uh, established works i think vector control is a space that deals with and I think we want to look at that as pests. I don't think we've, we've, we've pests, whether it deals with rodents, pests, whether it deals with um, uh, insects, uh, and, and things to that extent. Uh, and that on the, on the animal control side, that we deal with the animals as it relates to the nuisance and the problems they provide against the, the health and safety for the community, if that, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Okay. All right, well, we will be in contact. Um, we will be working with you in, in partnership, uh, Mr. Vincent Metley, and looking at long-term strategy and figuring out, you know, how best we move forward in addressing this issue. Because at the end of the day, I don't think it's going anywhere. 
um, over my brief time here at council, being a council person representing the second councilmatic district, it's only uh, increased in terms of a concern through phone calls to my office in the capacity of me being here. And that's what, has, that's what drove us to say, you know what, let's have a hearing and give us an idea on how we move forward. And so um, I want to thank everyone. Is there anyone else here for public testimony? If that, if not, I would like to, one person? Okay, come on up, sir. State your name. Uh, my name is Kevin Malone. I reside uh, North Philadelphia, uh, Willington Street. It's about three blocks, four blocks west of Broad Street. I think that the concern that we're seeing in our neighborhood is actually um, there's an abandoned home. And I, I came in late, so I don't know if this was brought up before, but I think there's an abandoned home where there's multiple families of raccoons that are actually living in that house, and they will crawl out, and as I heard as I was coming in, they're very, they're very friendly, uh, a little too friendly for, uh, you know, my liking, and um, they will go right next to your door, come into your backyard when there's people out there, especially, mm. we have a grill, you know, we like to grill, we're trying to barbecue, they smell that, they love that, they eat that up, so, I, I like, what, what, what could a strategy be for situations where we have families living in abandoned homes um, or condemned homes um, and then you know at night when, when they come out that's that's they got a, they got a nice place to stay if they're just you know shacking up and in, in, in an old row home so mm -hmm. um, what's what's how, how could we approach that what, what do we think so part of that will be working in partnership with L&I because they do the clean and seal Mm -hmm. of the abandoned building. And I think, again, that's why collectively, collectively we have to have everybody at the table on the issue. But that's, that's basically a clean and seal issue. And hopefully, as we move forward, if everybody's working in sync with one another, and let's say you come out, you have a complaint, this particular house, you have family of raccoons living in there, animal control unit, they come out, remove them, and then hopefully that property will be sealed properly where we won't have the issue. But also there's another issue regarding l and that we'll have to address in the long term that only, I think it's the first floor, uh, windows, are, windows and doors are sealed, but not the second floor. And so that's something that we have to look at further to try to figure out, okay, if they scale on the walls and they can't get in on the first floor, they'll just scale the walls and go in on the second floor. And so. That's part of a longer conversation that we have to see, but that's why we're having this hearing, at least to start the process as opposed to standing idly by and just letting this issue just takes place throughout the city and with no type of feedback, no type of strategy, no type of um, thought process on how to address the issue, but most importantly, a plan on addressing the issue. You finished? Yeah, I guess, I guess just one more question I'll ask mm -hmm. before I get out of here. Um, just, just going forward, what can uh, the best thing for the residents in the neighborhood to do? You know, going forward to get involved with this committee, um, or just any strategies that were recommended before I got here. I don't know if anyone from Animal Control, but they yeah. have. Uh, so I'm gonna do this to be brief. One, if you wanna um, participate and follow up, is get in contact with my office two one five six eight six three four one two, and one of my staff members will talk to you prior to you leaving. And then also get in contact with the animal con control unit. They'll give you the best. Uh, they just gave me a card on just some of the um, key things that uh, residents can do to address this particular issue um, from an information standpoint. Okay. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, absolutely. Please state Hi. your name for the record, please. Sarah Peters. I'm in Point Breeze. I actually spoke with the councilman this morning. I stopped yes. him to talk about this. Yes. Um, I have had a horrible problem with families of raccoons in my backyard. I have an 18 month old child who I will not allow go back there because they are so aggressive. Uh, they are not afraid of you at all. Um, in fact, if you go out there and you start doing all these tactics, because yes, I have called um, ACT, I've called 311, 
um, and they gave me all kinds of tips on how to try and keep the, this menace out of my backyard, uh, and none of it works. Mm -hmm. These raccoons are there to go after you. I mean, they know that you're more scared of these gigantic creatures, and there are four or five of them together, all fanning out around you. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially, all of these preventative me measures, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. really don't work. We keep talking about abandoned buildings, mm -hmm. but no one is also addressing the issue of construction that mm -hmm. is not secured. Okay, mm. so there are a whole bunch of these raccoons, right, that are also actually finding shelter in these construction areas that they have no fencing around, that they have absolutely no security around. So I, you know, I don't have, at this point, any abandoned buildings. I was on Point Breeze Ave uh, two days ago, and I had a raccoon in the middle of the day start hissing at me. Mm. And I'm like, okay, this is... This is insane. But yes, I think that's another thing that we really need to look at, the <laughs> fact that we have all this unsecured construction going on, and these raccoons are hiding out in those buildings as well. And you might, might consider that even though you had more abandoned buildings mm -hmm. before, and yet this raccoon problem has gotten worse as we've been seeing all this construction happening, yes. is they are finding shelter in those buildings. Mm -hmm. I know that for a fact. Wow. This started when I had massive construction going on around my property because a whole bunch of these buildings went up. Uh, I'm at 1942 Annan Street. They mm -hmm. build these very large, it's been completely, you know where exactly mm -hmm. where yes, it is, right? I mean, yes. we've, we've got massive amounts of construction that happened over mm -hmm. the last few years. Uh, so I'm just proposing that we have to look into some other issues besides just the the abandoned housing, mm -hmm. and also say, hey, listen, you know, again, if we have unsecured uh, construction going on, they're going to definitely be hiding out there as well. And uh, I'm sorry, but I mean, all the times that I called about this problem, there was absolutely no reaction whatsoever. They just kept telling me, uh, we can't come deal with it if, that, if the animal isn't physically in your living room, we can't come out there. And yet, mm. um, some a, a contractor hit a cat one day on on my street in which we have a million of these feral cats and they were out there within 20 minutes to pick mm. up the cat okay right I, wow. and i followed up about the cat and they were like oh well, we had to euthanize the cat because it was so badly damaged but i'm thinking and i did say to them i was like okay so i've called a million times about these raccoons and you you send someone within 20 minutes for a cat and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Any other? Anyone else have public testimony? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, Councilman Al do you have any questions? Thank you. thank you for taking your time for your testimony. This, saying none of the committee will stand in recess to the call of the chair. Thank you very much.